What's good? What's good? What's good? Had to back off just a second ago because my phone was acting crazy. What's good with everybody? I wanted to go live today, and, I, and if y'all was uh, if y'all was just up here, my shit was acting crazy, so that's why I had to restart it. I wanted to talk about the Mahafa. And one of the last conversations we had, Hatchet, stop. One of the last conversations we had, uh, it talked about the eugenics movement towards it. Like as we was watching it, it went into the eugenics movement and how it was affecting, um, you know, and I was telling you about birth control. And it was one of the last videos we watched was just talking about the eugenics. And I noticed a lot of people was really interested in that um, conversation when I was when it when the when the video led in talking about eugenics. And it was the eugenics is like the science that they was using, you know, like after slavery and, and, and during the times of before slavery that they was trying to prove that the black man and the black woman was inferior and that we was the closest thing to the animal to the animals then and we closer to the animals than they are. You remember that? So I wanted to get another documentary. I was thinking about it the other night and I realized that um one of the best documentaries I seen was the Maafa. And the Maafa is just talking about black genocide in the 21st century in America. And it was something that really affected me back when I was studying. So it's two videos a day. It's the Maafa, and I'm going to show a lot of that. And then I'm going to show you the law of the more, which is if you're interested in how to go in the courtroom and represent yourself, that's what that's about. But let's tune in. In my nets, your doing with them is the greatest misfortune. They have been undone by your doings, and all they now ask and really have need of at your hands is just to let them alone. Frederick Douglass, 1862. It is the stupidity of man to think that he can do evil, even some monstrous evil, and it won't have any backlash on himself. But of course, it seldom works that way, and the moment he figures that out, he starts looking for a way to avoid the repercussions of what he's done. This is what happened with slavery. In the early 1800s, as it began to look like the end of slavery might be on the horizon, white America started to be concerned that a day of reckoning was coming. The primary fear for the average person was of retribution and insurrection, and that was a reasonable fear. After all, it's illogical to think that you can do to a whole group of people what was done to African Americans and think that they will just take it lying down forever. And of course, there were things like the Nat Turner uprisings. But for the wealthy elite, their fears went beyond things like insurrection. They were worried about the financial impact. Remember, it was not just the cotton plantations that profited from slavery. Whether you're talking about the banks, uh, or the insurance companies, uh, the railroads, even the newspapers, the fact is that almost every aspect of the American economy was at some level or another invested in the slave business. You also need to recognize that for the wealthy elitist who controlled this system, slaves were an asset as long as they were slaves. But at the moment they are set free, they become a liability. And what the elite knew was that the end of slavery would instantly release four million people into the economy who had been kept uneducated and effectively unemployable anywhere but the cotton field. And what they were concerned about was that this was going to bankrupt the American economy. Taxes were going to go through the roof to take care of these people. Crime was going to be rampant. The prisons were going to be flooded. There was going to be this population overrun. And in the North, the biggest fear was migration from the South of these black people. The other fear that these people had was intermarriage between blacks and whites would lead to a loss of racial purity. The question was, what were they gonna do about it? And their initial thought was that they would just send all the slaves back to Africa. This plan was called colonization, and it had broad support among the wealthy elite. In fact, the American Colonization Society was even funded by the United States Congress. But in the end, colonization proved to be unworkable, and the idea was eventually scrapped. But about that same time, a new philosophy was emerging in the world. It was called eugenics. And for some, it seemed like the perfect solution to, had, to what had become known as the Negro Dilemma. I do not join in the belief that the African is our equal in brain or in heart. 
and I believe that if we can, in any fair way, possess ourselves of his services, we have an equal right to utilize them to our advantage. Francis Galton, 1857. Francis Galton is known as the father of eugenics. He actually coined the phrase eugenics. So he believed in trying to increase those he felt were superior in stock and decrease those he felt were inferior. Francis Galton came from a very wealthy family, a family that made its wealth from the slave trade. And what a lot of people don't know is that Francis Galton was a cousin to Charles Darwin. Francis Galton took Charles Darwin's philosophies and ideas and thoughts and he actually put them into practice and that's what we know today as eugenics. Eugenics and evolution are related in that they both see what they consider to be the um, highest form of primate, such as the gorilla, as almost indistinguishable from what they consider the lowest form of human, the African and the Aborigine. At some future period, not very distant as measured by centuries, the civilized races of man will almost certainly exterminate and replace the savage races throughout the world. The break between man and his nearest allies will then be wider, for it will intervene between man and a more civilized state, and some ape as low as a baboon instead of as now between the Negro or Australian and the gorilla. Charles Darwin, 1890. Charles Darwin is very well known for writing uh, The Origin of Species in the 1800s. This book gave rise to evolutionary theory. What people don't know is that there was actually uh, a longer original title to this book, and that was On the Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection or the Preservation of Favored Races in the Struggle for Life. Now, uh, copies and editions that they made afterwards eliminated that phrase about the favored races. Evidently, they understood then that it was politically incorrect. Some may defend Francis Galton because eventually that he rejected slavery, but uh, they do point out that all of his wealth did derive from the slave trade, but also it needs to be known that he, as well as other eugenists, did not reject slavery until after it had ended, and they could not any longer exploit blacks legally. So at that point, it would have been quite easy for he and uh, his cohorts to uh, reject slavery. Well, I think this is a point that we all have to really realize that the eugenics movement was not uh, invented by the everyday average uh, white American, but by a select group of wealthy white elitists that had often uh, used uh, this ideology to pit all of white America against black America. And so we see that indeed that truly is the case even to this day. Average Negroes possess too little intellect, self-reliance, and self-control to make it possible for them to sustain the burden of any respectable form of civilization without a large measure of external guidance and support. Francis Galton, 1873. Eugenicists believed that Africans were inferior, not just mentally, but physically, and that left to themselves, left alone, they would not make it. The problem is, it didn't work. With that failure, the eugenicists moved on to what is known as positive eugenics. In positive eugenics, the eugenicists wanted the white population to reproduce, to have so many children that it overwhelmed the black population, but that didn't work either. Next, they moved on to what they called negative eugenics. They knew that they could not round up all the blacks in the nation and execute them, so they decided to create an environment where they would convince the blacks to severely limit the number of children they were going to have and thereby commit race suicide. The problem of the socially fit must be treated not as one of color, but as a problem of the spread of feeble-mindedness. Dr. Charles Davenport, 1913, director of the Eugenics Record Office, Cold Spring Harbor, New York, and co-founder of the American Eugenics Society. The eugenics realized that they could not uh, promote their agenda simply because they knew it would be viewed 
as politically incorrect and socially unacceptable. So what they did was use code words that were once successful in slavery, terms such as feeble-minded, uh, unfit, uh, words such as imbecile, immoral, criminal, they uh, tagged those labels upon the targeted community. Uh, these words were less inflammatory, so it, get, it let society more or less not be totally alarmed of the original intent, but deep down inside, I believe everyone truly knew what segment of society and what people they were actually uh, talking about. Even a cursory glance at the charts, photographs, and diagrams used to popularize eugenic ideals reveals that the unfit were swarthy, black, and ugly by Anglo-Saxon standards, with flattened noses, wiry hair, and prognathous profiles. Harriet Washington, author, Medical Apartheid. In the early 20th century, the white elitists who made up the eugenics movement were no longer just philosophers and academics. Now they were industrialists and billionaires who had come to embrace a worldview that was essentially identical to the eugenics movement. The same individuals and corporations who had once made millions on the backs of slaves were now willing to spend millions to get rid of them. But that didn't mean that these guys were interested in being public crusaders for the eugenics movement. They were certainly willing to be the brains and the money behind it, but they would hire crusaders to do the dirty work. And the primary one they settled upon was a woman named Margaret Sanger. She was the founder of the... And I want you to realize when they keep saying the word crusader, 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 the, the Christian crusades is what happened when they conquered all the Africans. They conquered all of the Africans on the planet, and that's what we know Africans. When the Europeans conquered all the Africans, it was called the Christian crusades. So that should make you think about the religion. The American Birth Control League and the publisher of its newsletter, The Birth Control Review. On a practical level, the relationship between Sanger and these elitists was uh, basically a marriage of convenience. In order to advance their common agendas, they needed a front man and she needed money. And the whole thing would be held together by this kind of bizarre obsession with race and class. The result was that the American Birth Control League became the driving force behind the American eugenics movement. Eugenics would no longer just be a philosophy. Sanger and others like her were gonna put it into practice. We are paying for and even submitting to the dictates of an ever increasing, unceasingly spawning class of human beings who never should have been born at all. Margaret Sanger, 1922. The laws of nature require the obliteration of the unfit, and human life is valuable only when it is of use to the community or race. Madison Grant, 1916, co-founder, American Eugenics Society. The black man has never been a competitor, but has always been subservient to the white race. And just so long as he remains subservient, his position is secure. And just so soon as he becomes a competitor, his fate is sealed. Dr. Benjamin Hayes, eugenicist, 1905. The American Birth Control League was wise enough to get their program of population control across by using what had worked in the past, the same code words that had established the institution of slavery and that was also used by the early eugenics movement was once again used by the American Birth Control League. The Marcus Sangers of those days did not come out and say they were trying to eliminate black people. What they did say, they were trying to rid society of the feeble-minded. They were trying to rid the society of the criminal. Well, she was successful simply because of her eugenics friends for the past 50 years had uh, put those labels on minorities and African Americans and therefore society was more or less desensitized. In effect, the code words hid the agenda of Margaret Sanger and the eugenist. At that time, they did uh, shift over to the, what they call the quality of life. Uh, it was a philosophy unquestionably used to target the poor simply because what the quality of life at its core meaning was that poor people really didn't have a reason to live. Only uh, the white, 
those with status had any chance of a meaningful or purposeful life. Uh, the solution for the poor now was not to eliminate the circumstances that would cause poverty. Their solution now was to eliminate the poor, eliminate the impoverished, and just wipe them off the face of the earth. The practice of birth control among the majority of colored people would probably be more eugenic than among their white compatriots. The dissemination of the information of birth control should have begun with this class, rather than with the upper social and economic classes of white citizens. Walter Turpening, Birth Control Review, 1932. In virtually every community where Negroes dwell, one finds them in fat times and lean alike contributing a disproportionate number to the roles of the dependents and delinquents. They make excessive demands on the white man's charity and overtax his patients. Newell Sims, Birth Control Review, 1932. Author Madison Grant was a co-founder of the American Eugenics Society and an officer of the New York Zoological Society. In 1906, he had authorized an exhibit at the Bronx Zoo in which a 22-year-old African named Oda Benga was displayed in a cage in the monkey house. Sharing the cage with Benga was an orangutan. When a local clergyman protested the exhibit, he said that it was clearly intended to be a demonstration of Darwin's theory of evolution. Local proponents of Darwinism apparently agreed and labeled the display educational. Ten years after Trina, this event, Oda Benga committed suicide. During Hitler's regime, the Germans were supplied with elaborate charts and complicated theses supposedly proving the superiority of the German people. It is interesting to note that at the bottom of these charts were the colored people of the world, most conspicuously, the black people. Floyd McKissick, National Director, Congress of Racial Equality, 1967. An often overlooked fact about the German Holocaust is that the Nazis did not simply target the Jewish population, they went after the black community as well. Under the threat of being sent to concentration camps if they did not cooperate, Afro-German citizens were not only forced to undergo sterilization themselves, they were also required to turn over their children for sterilization. In his book Mein Kampf, Adolf Hitler explained the motivation behind such programs. The Jews were responsible for bringing Negroes into the Rhine. It suits the purpose of the cool, calculating Jew who would use this means of introducing a process of bastardization in the very center of the European continent and, by infecting the white race with the blood of an inferior stock, would destroy the foundations of its independent existence. Adolf Hitler, Mein Kampf. The Nazi attitude toward blacks was clearly defined in a 1944 book by Robert Ley, who was the head of the German labor front. Ley characterized the Jewish race as a disease-riddled parasite that had been created by unnatural inbreeding between white men and the racially inferior Negro. He described the result as a racial swamp that would eventually destroy the natural superiority of the Aryan race. Another Nazi publication described blacks as African brutes who had not been tamed even by centuries of slavery. It went on to say that any effort to assimilate people of African descent into civilized society was a waste of time and that the lynchings of blacks in America did not merit any regret. Since World War II, it has been well documented that Adolf Hitler was profoundly influenced by the American eugenics movement and that many of his government's racial policies were actually developed from the writings of American eugenicists like Madison Grant and Harry Laughlin. In fact, Hitler referred to Grant's book, The Passing of the Great Race, as his Bible. Meanwhile, American eugenicists were routinely praising Hitler and holding up the Nazi eugenics program as a model for the United States to copy. The leader of the German nation, Adolf Hitler, has been able to construct a comprehensive racial policy of population development and improvement. The difference between the Jew and the Aryan is as unsurmountable as that between black and white. 
Germany has set a pattern which other nations must follow. Dr. Clarence Gordon Campbell, 1935, President, Eugenics Research Association, New York. Among those American eugenicists who most strongly supported the Nazis was a member of the American Eugenics Society, a director of the American Birth Control League, and a writer for the Birth Control Review. His name was Lothrop Stoddard. As an avowed racist, Stoddard was the author of a book called The Rising Tide of Color Against White World Supremacy, which was widely promoted by the Ku Klux Klan. In another book, The Dragon and the Cross, Stoddard was identified as the exalted Cyclops of the Massachusetts chapter of the Klan. Non-white races must be excluded from America. The red and black races, if left to themselves, revert to a savage or semi-savage state in a short time. Lothrop Stoddard, Director, American Birth Control League. On the 19th of December, 1939, during a four-month stay in Germany, Stoddard was given a personal meeting with both Adolf Hitler and the man who would eventually be in charge of the Nazi Holocaust, SS leader Heinrich Himmler. Later, when a course on race was introduced at Halle University in Germany, its instructor stated that it would be modeled on the philosophies of American eugenicists, including Lothrop Stoddard. Eventually, Stoddard's racial views would even be featured in Nazi school textbooks. The white race divides into three main subspecies, the Nordics, the Alpines, and the Mediterraneans. All three are good stocks, ranking in genetic worth well above the various colored races. Lothrop Stoddard, Director, American Birth Control League. To eliminate blacks from Germany, one of the people Hitler called on was a eugenicist who had once written that blacks are an inferior race of savages who should only be allowed to survive as long as they are of use to the Aryan race. His name was Eugen Fischer. And about 20 years earlier, he had been one of the leaders of a system of concentration camps in southwestern Africa, where blacks were rounded up to be executed, experimented on, or held as free labor. Under Hitler, Fischer would serve on committees that planned the sterilization of all blacks in countries that came under German control. He would also be one of the first Nazi scientists to become publicly affiliated with the Carnegie-funded eugenics laboratory in Cold Spring Harbor, New York. Eventually, Fischer would also be put in charge of the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute, which was funded by the Rockefeller Foundation. It was here that many of the Nazi programs for creating racial purity were developed. In 1927, Margaret Sanger organized the World Population Conference in Geneva, Switzerland, and gave it front page coverage in her birth control review. The events program shows that several of its attendees were colleagues of Sanger's from the American eugenics movement. It also documents that among those who were given a leadership role in the conference was Eugen Fischer, the man who would eventually lead the Nazi effort to eradicate blacks from Europe. Another American eugenicist with Nazi connections was Harry Laughlin. Now, he was an official with both the American Eugenics Society and the American Birth Control League. And in 1928, his plan for using forced sterilization to eliminate those who might produce what he called degenerate offspring was published in the Birth Control Review. In 1936, Laughlin led an effort to distribute the English language version of a Nazi eugenics film to audiences in the northeastern part of the United States. He had acquired the rights to the film from the Race Policy Office of the Nazi Party and, with the help of two other American eugenics organizations, had mailed literature to biology teachers at 3,000 U.S. high schools, urging them to show it in their classrooms. Later that year, Laughlin was praised in a Nazi newspaper and awarded an honorary degree from the University of Heidelberg for his contributions to the Nazi eugenics effort. In the 1930s, a German psychiatrist named Ernst Rudin was named president of the International Federation of Eugenics in Cold Spring Harbor, New York, which was funded by the Carnegie Corporation. And in 1933, his call for racial purity was published in the Birth Control Review. Later. Rudin would be chosen by Hitler to write Germany's eugenics laws. And at one point, he personally helped the Gestapo round up and sterilize several hundred blacks 
who they referred to as Rhineland Bastards. After the war, Rudin would be identified as one of the architects of the barbaric medical experiments that the Nazis carried out in their concentration camps. It may be possible that Hitler actually got the idea for concentration camps while studying the American eugenics movement. In 1919, the state of Indiana had allocated $300,000 to create a work colony in the city of Butlerville, where those who were labeled feeble-minded would be incarcerated. Then in 1932, Margaret Sanger called for the United States government to set aside farms and open spaces where certain groups of people would be segregated from the rest of society. She proposed that, among others, the illiterate, the unemployed, and the poor should be forcibly kept in these areas until they developed what she called better moral conduct. It was later discovered that under the Indiana program, the state was allowed to label someone feeble-minded if they were poor or did not do well in school or if the state considered them to be shiftless or have insufficient moral judgment. But it's important to understand that this Indiana campaign was not unlike those in other states. For example, a eugenics project conducted in Massachusetts during the late 1920s proposed sterilization for young girls who were diagnosed as defective, which could include being unwed and pregnant, financially poor, or if the state labeled them socially undesirable. In addition, boys as young as 14 could be castrated for showing signs of kleptomania or for exhibiting what was described as solitary behavior. In a single incident during 1935, the Nazis sterilized the children of over 600 German women because it was reported that those children had been fathered by black men. When news of this reached the United States, a member of the American Eugenics Society named Walter Ashby Plecker wrote a letter to the German Bureau of Human Betterment and Eugenics praising them for the action and expressing his hope that not one child had been missed. Ten years earlier, Plecker had written that the black population was the greatest problem and most destructive force which confronts the white race and American civilization. Eugenics goals are most likely attained under a name other than eugenics. Frederick Osborne, president and founding member of the American Eugenics Society. By the late 1930s and early 1940s, revelations about Nazi and fascist atrocities in Europe were causing the public to become increasingly uncomfortable with terms like eugenics and population control. This alarmed the leaders of the American Birth Control League who were aware that this shifting attitude could impact both their ability to implement their racial agenda and their ability to raise funds. They were also aware that the connections between the American Birth Control League and the Nazis were starting to become known. Marketing research had shown them that in this environment, they needed to move away from words like control in favor of less threatening words like planning. So in 1942, they changed the name of the organization. From then on, the American Birth Control League would officially be known as Planned Parenthood. The important thing to understand here is that this name change did not change the organization's agenda. The same people were still in control, they were still obsessed with race, and they were still dedicated to eugenics. Today, defenders of Margaret Sanger will often try to hide her racism by claiming that she was not really a eugenicist and that Planned Parenthood was never part of the eugenics movement. But the truth is that as late as 1956, the American Eugenics Society listed Sanger as a member of the organization. In addition, many of Sanger's colleagues and the people whose writings she published, as well as many of Planned Parenthood's officers, were also known to be members. In fact, the ties between Sanger and the eugenics movement were so well established that in the 1920s, Sanger pursued a plan to merge the American Birth Control League, or Planned Parenthood as it was later called, with the American Eugenics Society. However, despite Sanger's efforts, the merger plan died after being rejected by the leadership of the American Eugenics Society. 
As an alternative, Sanger then proposed that the two organizations at least combine their publications into one magazine. But again, that idea was also rejected by the American Eugenics Society. The eugenic and civilization value of birth control is becoming apparent to the enlightened and the intelligent. The campaign for birth control is not merely of eugenic value, but is practically identical and ideal with the final aim of eugenics. Margaret Sanger, 1921. In her autobiography, Margaret Sanger wrote about a speech she gave in 1926 at a Ku Klux Klan rally in Silver Lake, New Jersey. The Planned Parenthood founder bragged about the fact that afterward, she was invited by 12 other Klan chapters to speak at their events. At about the same time, the American Birth Control League was changing its name to Planned Parenthood. A lot of books and reports began coming out that attempted to put a happy face on eugenics. And many of them were written by people that were associated with Planned Parenthood. The strategy here was obvious. Since the Nazis had turned eugenics into a four-letter word, the American eugenics movement decided it was time to lay low. So most of their writings during this time period downplayed the role of eugenics and couched their agenda in terms of helping the African-American. Perhaps the best example of this is a 1,500-page book by eugenicist Gunnar Myrdal called An American Dilemma, The Negro Problem in Modern Democracy. Interestingly, this book was not the result of some mom-and-pop operation. Myrdal had 75 assistants working on this project whose salaries were being paid for by the Carnegie Corporation, and Carnegie had been a major player in the eugenics movement for many years. Gunnar Myrdal and his wife Alva were both involved in eugenics. They were funded by both the Rockefeller Foundation and the Carnegie Corporation. They were also closely linked to a Swedish eugenics program which forcibly sterilized 66,000 people. When you read chapter seven of this book, it becomes undeniable that this is a blueprint for the modern eugenics movement that we still see in the United States today. The bottom line is that Gunnar Murdahl believed that not only could blacks not help themselves, he felt that nobody could help them, and the only solution in his eyes was to get rid of them. Commonly, it is considered a great misfortune for America that Negro slaves were ever imported. The presence of Negroes in America today is usually considered a plight of the nation. Chapter 7, page 167. All white Americans agree that if the Negro is to be eliminated, he must be eliminated slowly, so as not to hurt any living individual Negroes. Chapter 7, page 168. The only way possible of decreasing Negro population is by means of controlling fertility. Chapter 7, page 170. Birth control facilities could be extended relatively more to Negroes than to whites, since Negroes are more concentrated in the lower income and education classes. Chapter 7, page 176. One thing I find very revealing about Chapter 7 is the first paragraph. Murdahl uses U.S. Census Bureau figures to show that between 1790 and 1940, the black population in the United States increased 17 times. At the same time, those Census Bureau figures show that the white population increased 37 times. However, neither Murdahl nor any other eugenicist wrote anything about what to do about that part of the population that was increasing twice as fast as the black population. Gunnar Murdahl's book on how to resolve what he called the Negro problem was published in 1944 by Harper and Brothers of New York. Four years earlier, the same company, which is today known as Harper Collins, had also published a book by one of the founding members of the American Eugenic Society. At the time that Harper and Brothers published these books, its president was a man named Cass Canfield, who would later become the national president of Planned Parenthood. We hope that the restraint of population growth can come about through voluntary means, but if it does not, involuntary methods will be used. 
Dr. Donald Minkler, 1972. Donald Minkler was the president of the American Association of Planned Parenthood Physicians and a member of the board of directors of Planned Parenthood Federation of America. Like many of those in the eugenics movement, he understood that their plans would not always be voluntarily adopted and that the use of governmental coercion or even force might one day be necessary. The idea of forced eugenics was not something that suddenly developed in the 1970s. In a 1929 speech, American eugenicist Samuel Holmes had proposed that mandatory birth control should be used as a tool to eliminate what he called the menace to the white race that had been created by increases in black population. His solution was to have a quota system in which the right to have a child would be controlled by the government and determined by race. At the time, Holmes was on the National Council of the American Birth Control League, which would later become known as Planned Parenthood. Then, in 1936, eugenicist Julian Huxley proposed that the genetically inferior classes could be made to have fewer children if they were denied easy access to welfare. Another part of this proposal was that medical care to these same people should be restricted in order to reduce the survival rates of the children they did have. He also called for the forced sterilization of anyone who was unemployed beyond a certain length of time. Huxley was later honored by Planned Parenthood and was a featured speaker at one of their annual conventions. The reality is that the views of people like Samuel Holmes and Julian Huxley were never uncommon within the American eugenics community. In 1969, a professor at the University of California, Dr. Garrett Hardin, called it insanity to rely on volunteerism to control population. Hardin was a member of the American Eugenics Society and an outspoken advocate of government-enforced birth control, saying that citizens should be willing to give up their right to breed for the betterment of society. In 1980, he was given Planned Parenthood's highest national award. He and his wife would later kill themselves in a joint suicide pact. There were, of course, some within the eugenics movement who were uncomfortable with the idea of using force, and they would often express their reservations about it in public. But when pressed, virtually none of them would rule it out, including Planned Parenthood founder Margaret Sanger. I consider that the world and almost our civilization for the next 25 years is going to depend upon a simple, cheap, safe contraceptive to be used in poverty-stricken slums, jungles, and among the most ignorant people. Even this will not be sufficient, because I believe that now, immediately, there should be national sterilization for certain dysgenic types of our population who are being encouraged to breed and would die out were the government not feeding them. Margaret Sanger, 1950. This was written by Sanger in a personal letter to Catherine Dexter McCormick, McCormick was an heir to the international harvester fortune and would later use part of her immense wealth to fund the development of the birth control pill. In 1966, an example of the coercive power of state eugenics laws was seen in Maryland when three young mothers applied for welfare benefits. All three were arrested for child neglect, even though the authorities never claimed to have any evidence of abuse or neglect. Instead, the women were held under a state law which stated that simply being unmarried and pregnant was child neglect. The judge in this case warned the women that if they ever became pregnant again, the state would take custody of all their children. Officials in Prince George's County, where the arrest took place, stated that welfare recipients could avoid being prosecuted under this law by submitting to state-sponsored birth control education. In 1934, Adolf Hitler sent a letter to American eugenicist Leon Whitney, complimenting him for a book he had written on sterilization. Whitney was the former executive secretary of the American Eugenics Society and a colleague of Margaret Sanger's. Sanger also published his writings in the Birth Control Review. In the book that Hitler was praising, Whitney had written that America could eliminate what he called the slum elements of society by sterilizing the lowest 25% of its population. 
He claimed this was necessary because such people are too stupid to understand or practice even simple methods of contraception. Besides, he said, the country would hardly miss them. One of the people he was talking about was named Elaine Riddick. At the age of 13, I became pregnant. I was raped by a guy that lived across the street from me. He snatched me off the street and molested me and threatened my life and said if I ever told anyone that he would kill me. When they was delivering my son, they sterilized me at the same time. They had approached my grandmother and said that if she wanted to continue to receive supplement, welfare and food stamps, or um, at this time it was giving out these uh, surplus foods, canned cheese, I think it was, or powdered eggs, and said that if she did not sign the X, that they were gonna stop her supplements. Mind you, my grandmother was illiterate. She had never, ever gone to school. She didn't understand what it was. So she signed the X and they did this to me. I did not find out that they had sterilized me until I was 19 years old. I asked the state of North Carolina why they did this to me and they said that because I was feeble-minded, that I would not be able to take care of myself, I would not be able to tie my shoes, that I... You wanna hear some cold shit? This law still exists in North Carolina. Do y'all hear me? This law still exists in North Carolina. It's never been taken off the books. So if you have an underage daughter to get pregnant and then they can sterilize you, don't gotta tell you. I was uh, just incompetent. The state of North Carolina also said that I had never performed, at the age of 13, I had never performed a day's work in my life. They couldn't get me to do anything. But at the age of 13, I mean, should not have been in, should I not have been in school? They were saying that feeble-mindedness is hereditary. So they sterilized me so I would not produce my kind. Mind you, I am not illiterate, nor am I feeble-minded. I never went into high school but yet I still acquired a college degree. They also justified that my child or my children would be feeble-minded. My son is the president of his own semiconductor company. He has his own construction company. And he has his own real estate company. I just, I mean, how can you think that your government allowed or allowing these things to happen to a person, a, a life? You don't have, you can't say nothing. You have no rights. To me, they took away all of my rights. They sterilized kids from, at the, from my understanding and my knowledge as young as eight years of age. I don't know what an eight-year-old can do that could cause them to do this to them. The only reason I can give myself is that because they're black. In 1961, social worker Sue Casebolt had been installed as the executive secretary of the North Carolina Eugenics Board. At a board meeting held three weeks later, she stated that she was going to keep a file on every child whose name reached her desk so that they could be picked up as soon as they reached childbearing age. Casebold was still on the board in 1968 when it approved the sterilization of 14-year-old Elaine Riddick. It is better for all the world if instead of waiting to execute degenerate offspring for crime or to let them starve for their imbecility, 
Society can prevent those who are manifestly unfit from continuing their kind. Three generations of imbeciles are enough. Oliver Wendell Holmes, U.S. Supreme Court Justice, 1927. Holmes made this statement in his ruling on the constitutionality of Virginia's forced sterilization law. It mirrored the views of President Theodore Roosevelt, who had originally appointed Holmes to the Supreme Court. In a 1913 letter to American Eugenic Society founder Charles Davenport, Roosevelt had stated that the country had no business allowing citizens of the wrong type to reproduce. In 1907, Indiana had become the first of more than 30 states to pass sterilization laws. And some of those laws stayed on the books well into the 1970s. In fact, the state of Oregon did its last sterilization in 1981 and did not abolish its eugenics board until October of 1983. Some states practiced sterilization without ever creating an official eugenics board. In those instances, few if any records were kept. And in the states that did keep records, many have never been made available to the public. But in just those states that have released their records, it is known that at least 60,000 Americans were sterilized, and they were disproportionately black. In addition, during a 1973 lawsuit, a federal judge estimated that as many as 150,000 additional low-income women may have been sterilized under federal programs alone. These sterilizations were often performed without the patient's knowledge or consent, and sometimes against their will. It was also common for social workers to tell welfare recipients that they would lose their benefits if they did not agree to be sterilized. In some cases, poor families were even threatened with the loss of welfare unless they brought their children in for sterilization. The result was that some of the people sterilized were as young as 10 years old. In the first six months of 1972, one hospital in Aiken County, South Carolina, sterilized over one third of the Medicaid patients who were there to give birth, and all but one of these women were black. One patient said she was told by all three of the county's obstetricians that they would not deliver her baby unless she agreed to be sterilized. Her claim was later confirmed by each of the doctors. Another patient said she was told by one of these same physicians that he was tired of having to help support the babies of welfare recipients and that she could either agree to be sterilized or find another doctor. The law of nature says that only the fit shall survive. When a nation disregards this law by protecting the unfit and encouraging their multiplication, this nation invites inevitable destruction. As far as New Jersey is concerned, sterilization is an economic necessity. And as far as the United States is concerned, sterilization is a matter of national preservation. Fred Shepard, Assemblyman. Fred Shepard was a member of the New Jersey State Legislature. He made this statement upon his introduction of a sterilization bill in March of 1942. In some parts of the country, Planned Parenthood was closely associated with these state eugenics boards and was often a referral agency for them. But the system did not always run smoothly. In 1969, when the number of sterilizations approved by the Iowa State Eugenics Board began to drop, the board was attacked in the press by the executive director of Planned Parenthood, Robert Weber. He said that he was alarmed by the decline in numbers and that the Eugenics Board should expand its approval criteria. Board Chairman Dr. S.M. Corson responded that the board's guidelines were already fairly broad. He pointed out that approvals were routinely given for young girls for no reason other than the board's speculation that they might likely one day engage in immoral behavior without the capacity for being wives and mothers. At that point, Weber publicly scolded the board and told them that they should either increase the number of sterilizations or quit. From its beginning, Planned Parenthood always had powerful ties to the American eugenics community. In fact, in many places, they were often one and the same. For example, when the first birth control clinic was opened in Arkansas, it was operated by the Arkansas Eugenics Association and overseen by a woman named Hilda Cornish. Later, the Arkansas Eugenics Association would become the Arkansas State Affiliate 
of Planned Parenthood, and Cornish would be named its executive director. During the four months that American birth control league director Lockhart Stoddard was in Nazi Germany, he not only met with Hitler and SS chief Heinrich Himmler, he also attended one of the Nazi eugenics courts. The first case I saw looked like an excellent candidate for sterilization. A man in his mid-thirties, he was rather ape-like in appearance. Receding forehead, flat nose with flaring nostrils, thick lips, and heavy prognathous jaw. Not vicious look, but gross and rather dull. Lothrop Stoddard, director, American Birth Control League, later known as Planned Parent. Given the admiration that Adolf Hitler expressed for the American eugenics movement, it is not unlikely that he modeled the eugenics courts in Nazi Germany after the state eugenics boards in the U.S. In both countries, feeble-mindedness was routinely used as a catch-all justification for sterilization, and the diagnosis of feeble-mindedness was almost always left up to the judgment of the person advocating the sterilization. First, the white man tells me to sit in the back of the bus. Now it looks like he wants me to sleep under the bed. Back in the days of slavery, black folks couldn't grow kids fast enough for white folks to harvest. Now that we got a little taste of power, white folks wants to call a moratorium on having babies. Comedian Dick Gregory, Ebony Magazine, 1971. By the 1960s, the American eugenics movement had been reasonably successful in getting sterilization laws and prohibitions against interracial marriage passed. They also had some success in getting states to mandate sterilization for those convicted of even non-sexual crimes, and some states began to require sterilization as a condition for receiving welfare or health care. Meanwhile, another state proposed jail time for anyone who had a child out of wedlock unless they agreed to be sterilized, and at least one state required sterilization as a condition of being released from custody. But these laws were not producing the results Planned Parenthood and others in the eugenics movement wanted. They also began to fear that federal courts were going to eventually rule that these kinds of measures were unconstitutional. At about the same time, however, something new was being introduced to American society. It was called the birth control pill. And the eugenics movement quickly saw it as the perfect solution for controlling the population of people they had always seen as oversexed, unsophisticated, and lazy. But what they would eventually discover is that while the pill was enthusiastically embraced by whites, it was generally rejected by blacks despite the fact that Planned Parenthood focused its marketing on the African-American community and located the vast majority of its facilities in black neighborhoods. What Planned Parenthood and the rest of the eugenics movement did not count on was that many blacks did not want to reduce their numbers. In fact, they saw high birth rates as the most effective way to increase their power in the American political system. The other reality was that an increasing number of African Americans were becoming suspicious that a hidden agenda was behind the birth control revolution. Even those who once supported the idea of population control were beginning to sense that it actually meant black population control. This feeling was evident in June of 1970 when the Black Caucus walked out of the first National Congress on Optimum Population and Environment being held in Chicago. Felton Alexander of the National Urban League and the chairman of the Black Caucus said the action was taken because of clear and unmistakable evidence that the purpose of the conference was to legitimize the extermination of the black population. By this time, many other civil rights advocates were beginning to see the same thing. Contraceptives will become a form of drug warfare against the helpless in this nation. Jesse Jackson, 1971. There is a campaign to bombard the poor with pills and potions. If this movement continues, we soon may be accused of fighting poverty by eliminating the poor and overcoming hunger by removing the hungry. New York Congressman Hugh Carey, 1966. Under the cover of an alleged campaign to alleviate poverty, White supremacist Americans and their dupes are pushing an all-out drive to put rigid birth control measures into every black home. 
No such drive exists within the white American world. Black Unity Party, 1968. Birth control and sterilization in the wrong hands would be more deadly to Negroes than all the tanks, wide guns, cattle prods, billy clubs, and shackles we have overcome in the past. Dr. Leroy Swift, obstetrician, gynecologist, 1968. As it became clear that a growing number of African Americans were connecting the dots between birth control and black genocide, eugenics organizations began calling for the U.S. government to add birth control chemicals to the nation's food and water supply. It was even suggested that this strategy could be specifically targeted at urban neighborhoods. This idea was widely embraced in the eugenics movement and taken seriously enough by the government to be discussed at a 1969 meeting at the United Nations. Under the plan being considered, a couple could apply to the government for permission to have a child, and if approved, they would be given an antidote to the population control chemicals they had ingested in their food and water. Interestingly, the idea that government should have some sort of licensing agreement to regulate who would and would not be allowed to give birth was not a new one. In 1934, Planned Parenthood founder Margaret Sanger had proposed that the U.S. government implement a system in which women would not have the legal right to have a child without a permit from the government, and that these permits would only be good for one baby. But eventually, proposals like forced sterilization, chemicals in the food and water supply, and government control of childbearing were abandoned by most people in the eugenics movement. Despite the fact that many of them openly advocated such ideas, they would come to realize that there was really no practical way to carry them out. But for all their failures, what the eugenics movement had accomplished was to lay the foundation for the next phase of their plan. And this is where they would find the success that they had been chasing for over 100 years. What would you say is now the number one cause of death in the African-American community? Heart disease. Oh, HIV, AIDS. Uh, diabetes. Cancer. Uh, AIDS. I'll say heart disease. AIDS. From what I heard, it's probably AIDS, you know. Probably heart disease. Um, I think heart disease. Uh, HIV, no. Gang violence. What if I told you the real answer was abortion? Uh, uh. Since 1973, legal abortion has killed more African Americans than AIDS, cancer, diabetes, heart disease, and violent crime combined. Every week, more blacks die in American abortion clinics than were killed in the entire Vietnam War. And the largest chain of abortion clinics in the United States is operated by Planned Parenthood. Keep getting mad, frustrated out there, aborting them babies. See the problem in at the end of the day, we worried about, we got the situation that we got the problems with the police officers right now shooting niggas in the street. But it, without the police help, you know what I mean? It's so many children getting aborted in America, it's crazy. No, it's all good, it's all good. But now, like, that's that's the key. When I was thinking about this the other day, I seen this years ago too. This The whole thing with Planned Parenthood, it'll bother you, but it just need to be understood. We have now reached a point in this country that African-American women, though they make up 12% of the population, they account for 37% of the abortions. An African-American baby is almost five times more likely to be aborted than a white child. The abortion industry at this point kills as many African-American people every four days as the Klan killed in 150 years. And you can truly say the most dangerous place for an African American to be is in the womb of their African American mother. 
all across America. You can stand outside of the abortion clinics and see a steady stream of black women coming in and out. But somewhere along the way, we got the idea that this is a white issue or a conservative issue or a Republican issue, and therefore... My fault, y'all. Somebody call me. ...abortion industry to carry out this genocide right under our very noses. Right now, in America, about half of our babies are being killed in the womb. And in certain parts of America, more of our babies are being aborted than are being born. When 17,000 aborted babies were found in a dumpster outside of a pathology laboratory in Los Angeles, California, some 12 to 15,000 were observed to be black. Irma Clardy Craven, Chairman, Minneapolis Commission on Human Rights and Secretary of the Urban League. To understand what the agenda was behind the legalization of abortion, all you need to do is look at the statistics from the U.S. government. Studies from the CDC show that prior to the legalization of abortion, approximately 80% of all illegal abortions were done on white women. One study in New York even found that white women had five times as many abortions as black women. But at the moment abortion became legal, that began to reverse. And that's why the legalization of abortion was so crucial for the eugenics movement. Legalization created the ability to market abortion in the black community. And from a eugenics standpoint, that changed everything. These people cannot have it both ways. First, they say that birth control will reduce the number of abortions. Then they flood our neighborhoods with birth control clinics. And what's the result? Our abortion rate skyrockets. So either they lied about the fact that birth control would reduce abortions in our neighborhoods, or this is the results and the purpose they wanted from the beginning. At this point, I truly have the tendency to believe the latter. In 1973, the year abortion was legalized nationwide, Dr. Christopher Tietze produced a study on abortion demographics at the request of the Population Council, a New York-based Let's chop it up. Let's talk for a second. I see the, the board going crazy. Cause I, let's talk about this for a second. Cause I see uh, Malia. It said, "Okay, understand this. Of course, they didn't educate anybody. Like they didn't tell anybody. It's not like it was something that came up in the school system, right? It ain't something that that they made everybody aware of. It was just something that, like in high school, uh, that's why I say your daughters can get to Planned Parenthood and get these intersect this and all of these things without your permission." So that was the point. The lack of education is the reason why they did it. What up? And so you got to just ask yourself in this whole situation with Planned Parenthood, the whole agenda and the whole time was to get you to believe as a woman that they know you're going to be upset what you're going through with the black relationship that we've been talking about lately, about with your man at home. And then you get mad and you know he probably BS and it's his fault. He ain't trying to help you stressed out already. He might have a kid already. And then you have an abortion. And it was never, it was never pushed to you that the agenda of Planned Parenthood, like since slavery was to abort black babies, but the key was to abort, to abort the Messiah in the womb. You know what I mean? So don't don't beat yourself up because they got a lot of people, yo. And then the crazy part is they don't even, they make it seem natural. You had your third kid, they come to you like, well, you wanna get your two side? You know what I'm saying? They're basically telling you that you don't got enough sense to stop having sex, you feel me? eugenics organization. In this report, Tietze confirmed previous research showing that when abortion is illegal, the abortion rate is much higher for white women than for black women, but that this completely reverses whenever abortion is legalized. At the time he published these findings, Tietze was a consultant to both Planned Parenthood and the National Abortion Federation. Other researchers within the eugenics and abortion movements we're also documenting that easy access to abortion clinics produces higher abortion rates in the surrounding area. And at least one expert discovered that having a nearby clinic is a bigger factor in the black abortion rate than it is in the white abortion rate. 
At the same time this data is being circulated, Planned Parenthood and the rest of the abortion lobby were in the process of locating the vast majority of their facilities in minority neighborhoods. Then in 1974, a study was released on population control that had been conducted by researchers at three major universities. By analyzing data obtained from Planned Parenthood's own records, they determined that the number one factor in deciding whether a county in the United States provided free or low-cost family planning services was not poverty, but race. The researchers said their findings seem to support the contention of many civil rights activists that such programs are less intended to assist the poor than they are to control the growth of the black population. Birth control and abortion are turning out to be the great eugenic advances of our time. Frederick Osborne, founding member of the American Eugenics Society. Hell yeah, what you think? Man, listen. Listen, listen, because I'm glad you said that. The the abortion babies, they use this shit for lotion. Uh, what's that movie, Limitless? You know what I'm saying? Well, it was Limitless, right? Where they was using that shit where it can go to the brain and it can enhance them. This is some real shit. They got this shit. This shit really exists. It came out like a year and a half ago. But they, a lot of the stuff they found is like in the is in the abortion baby. Like they say, like you know, like even the drug they talking about in Lucy, in, in, in Lucy, the movie Lucy, they were saying how like when a baby is being born, there's a there's a substance that's produced that create life, and that's what they chasing. So in the abortion baby, when they found that clinic that they was talking about. They had 7,000 embryos in it and 14,000, 14 to 15,000 was black babies. You know what I'm saying? They were taking something out of it. Not only that, but I believe also um, certain facial products uh, and then certain other studies that help like um, that help like certain things, parts of the body heal, they take it out of embryos. So, yeah. You know what I mean? So that's what they're, they're selling the abortion babies to other companies who who need the embryos to create things out of. You said they also got soda companies and fast food suppliers. You know, I was thinking about like with fast food because if you do the research and dig like some of the some of the amniotic sac or whatever they use, you know, well I guess some some of the abortion baby they use and I guess some of the meats and shit and like fast food. You said the vaccines and the immunization shots come um to the aborted fetus and black baby. You saying that they give it to them, or you saying it's oh they, oh they come from them? Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah, I heard that before. You know what I'm saying? I've heard that shit before. You know what I mean? But yeah, that's what it is. So they're not just you know or what they call it T cell research and shit. Yeah, all that. You know what I mean? Because when when life is created, and then the crazy part is they say it's a certain time where you can, where it's considered legal and illegal, but they got a heartbeat. And a lot of times in them stages, them babies is moving and breathing. You know what I'm saying? It says that's where they come from. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Stem cell. Yeah, not T cell. Stem cell research. That's that's exactly, you know what I mean? And and that whole shit is crazy. You know what I'm saying? Now, I'm going to stop there. I'm going to show you the name of this one real quick so y'all can catch it. Because this shit, like, it's like almost three hours long. And it's called My Alpha 21 Black Genocide in the 21st Century America. That's how you can find that. And on my last one to end it out is one that got to do with law, but I understand what be going on. So let's get it. Of emancipation and proclamation, and you will see that a proclamation is not a law. A proclamation is a public announcement by elected officials. It is not a law. So the Emancipation Proclamation of 1863 did not set any slaves free. What it did was standardize slavery, the United States being the model for the standardization of slavery, that all of the other nations around the world, as they reduced their people from their sovereign capacity and forced them to join nation states, then they were able to issue statute, codes, ordinances, resolutions on them. And a statute, as in a state statute of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, is not a law. It is corporate policy of the corporation that calls itself the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania Incorporated. All right? Now, a code is not a law. The United States codes 
the code of the laws of the United States of America that are used in federal court and the Supreme Court are not law. They are what they say they are. They are codes, ordinances, and resolutions of a municipality of the city of Philadelphia, which is a private nonprofit corporation that calls itself the city of Philadelphia, an ordinance and a resolution, as in parking ordinances, they are not law. They are what they say they are. They are ordinances and they are resolutions, all right? And the reason they are not law is because the only people who can issue law are people who are acting in their sovereign capacity. And the people who sit in these seats as elected officials are not, in fact, in their sovereign capacity. They are in a corporate ward status, meaning that they are wards of the state. They are members of the corporation, which is a nonprofit, that calls itself the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. And as long as they have a birth certificate on record with the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, with that birth certificate being a contract, a birth certificate is a contract. And as long as you have a contract with the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania Incorporated, you belong to them. And that's what slavery really is, All right? So who can use law? If you are a member of a corporate ward state, if you are a member of a corporate ward nation that calls itself the United States of America, you are a citizen. Look in the law dictionary and look up the definition of citizen. A citizen is not a sovereign. A resident is not a sovereign. Therefore, if you use an address, which is a fictitious number associated with a designation issued by a corporate ward, right? Then you become under the jurisdiction of those people who are also corporate wards, but who are also slaveholders, all right? So if you are operating in that capacity, law does not apply to you. If you are a resident of the city of Philadelphia, which is a private nonprofit corporation, and you say you are a resident of the city of Philadelphia, then the ordinances and the resolutions of that private nonprofit. In other words, you speak your existence. What you say, the, the part of the trick of what, why we get arrested is because of the things we say. Corporation apply to you. If you are a citizen of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania Incorporated, which is a private nonprofit corporation, then the statutes of that nonprofit corporation apply to you. If you are a citizen of the United States of America, which is a private nonprofit corporation, then the code of the laws, right, apply to you. But if you are a sovereign, of the Moorish Empire, those ordinances, those resolutions, those codes, those statutes do not apply to you because you are not a member of the corporate ward state. It's as simple as that. And they understand the difference. This is why on their documents, they use words of art. They use the word label. They use the word person. They use the word address. All of these things that place you in their jurisdiction and you unknowingly fill out forms every day and every time you fill out a form, you enter into a contract. I don't care what kind of form it is, it's a contract. A driver's license application is a contract. A social security application is a contract. When you call up the telephone company and you make a verbal contract over the telephone, this is why they can bill you. When you sign a deed, it is a contract. When you fill out a voter registration form, it is a contract. Does everybody understand that? Don't ever think every, anything that you put your signature on becomes a contract, all right? Now, the fact that you are not in your sovereign status means that you make a contract as a minor. They don't care, they know you are a minor because and, and to be other than a minor, you have to be in your proper person at law. And how we write that is this. Can I have a transcript? 
Can you bear with me for a minute and let me put this on because uh, I can't. Can y'all see that? Impropria persona. Impropria persona. When you are in your corporate ward status, you look like this to the court. Pro se. Pro se meaning they get you in the court and they bring someone in called a... Got that? Pro se cuter. A prosecutor. Because... You're in a corporate board status. Now, if you're in proper persona, say in their criminal allegations, the prosecutor cannot come into the courtroom and say anything to you because you're not in pro se status. Makes sense, right? The issues of law, the issues of law are threefold. The issues of law are status, jurisdiction, and adjudication. The first thing that happens when you walk into a courtroom in your corporate ward status is that they already make the assumption that you are a ward of the state and that you don't know any better. So they immediately start adjudicating you. As the first thing that happens when we walk into a courtroom is that we place our status on the record. It said as Moors, when we walk into the courtroom, we, we place our status on the record. Now, I'm going to back up a little bit and give you some context so this makes sense for, for, the, for everybody. It makes sense. When we're dealing with contracts, and this is a gift to y'all to have y'all thinking, when you're dealing with contracts, not just like record deals, but a contract is a contract, which means dead pledge. Any contract you sign, work, Credit cards, anything, as seen anything, electric bills, there are contracts. When you write your name, the definition for signature in the law book is the right to sell self. So that means that when you sign your name on something, you, you sold yourself into a legal binding contract. Right? So the people are like, why don't you get a record deal? Because I ain't, I ain't doing it. You know what I'm saying? So in, in this situation, when she's saying that no matter what you do, a contract is everything is a contract. Think about it. The Constitution is what? A contract. The Declaration of Independence is what? A contract. So the more that you start to understand contract law, the better that you'll start to understand what's really going on around you. You know what I'm saying? So she's saying that when you go to court, the first thing she said is that when you go to court, we we go to court because most of us don't know anything about law. We go to court in the status of pro se. And then as long as we stay in pro se, which is just not knowing, which that's when we get in the courtroom, whether you know it or not, there's things going on. But the status when we walk in the courtroom is pro se. Right. And if you stay in pro se, then you are then there's somebody called a pro se cuter who's going to adjudicate you, which is, you know, give you a fine, send you to jail, whatever. This is law we talking right now. Right. So when she's saying with a more, but they blanked it out. When we come to the courtroom, we state. We naturally we, st we put our status on the table, you know what I'm saying? Because like I was showing y'all the other video where he was telling you that white and black are not a people, their status is white being the people from the land, or ancestors who had the rights to the land, and black meaning a foreigner, right? So when we run around black lives matter, you're saying that the foreigners' lives matter, because white in the law book. And we watched these videos the other day. He told you he read out the law book. It says does not mean European, does not mean Caucasian race, means anybody with Moorish blood. Moorish blood is black blood. Well, we consider black blood. This is the importance of learning law and what I've been trying to bring to the table at different times, even taking it back to my family. Once you, once you start understanding these concepts, this is how you fight the problem. The problem is that when we're dealing with the word black, when I was studying, it bothered me because the word black, the status of black is civil little mortus, meaning that your civil liberties are, are, are given to a mortician, basically, which means you don't have any, they're dead. That's your legal status. As a black person. And you will never ever get civil liberties. You're trying to get civil rights for a status that doesn't have civil rights to it. That there's no civil liberties to the status. That's why we're fighting a war that doesn't make any sense. Because before slavery we had a name. White and black came later. 
Let's back up a little bit. Let me give you a little bit more context. After they freed the slaves, they said, fuck it, we, ain't, we don't want slaves. We can make everybody slaves except for the wealthy. So we'll tell these people, we get these people to say they white, these people say they black. And get them to think that these lost statuses are people. Right? So this is why people that know me, know me, know that see me around police officers that I don't play no games. If I, I ask them, like, well, I'm telling them this, like, how, sir, how you doing? I'm not black, I'm a Moor. I'm not bitter to the Christian color codes of 1724, which was a law document saying that they was going to change our name to, to Negroes, niggas, Ethiopians, and blacks, and African Americans and shit. And then I say, can I be the superior officer, sir? Now, I'm asking you, I'm asking you, but by law, you have to. And I understand cops don't know law, right? And I let them speak. They call their superior. Now, a few times I get an officer that's like, um, that's in school for law, and then they'll say they'll still call them, but they'll ask me some questions. You know what I'm saying? Now, the reason why they got to call the superior because they don't know how to deal with a nigga like this. And excuse my language, they, they, a lot of times the superior gonna come in and, and like the rest of the people in they, in they platoon or whoever, like the seven, eight officers you over gonna come over because they got to learn how to deal with this. So when I tell them, I lay my, when she's saying they lay their status on the table, you know what I'm saying? As a person, you know what I'm saying? Technically, we're white people according to the law books. So when you wonder where the problem comes from, when we go, we see somebody, I'll give you a better situation. Let me give you an example of legally how we fuck ourselves. It's three of my homeboys, you standing outside, a white boy walk up to us and smack the shit out of us, right? And I'm using these terms because we understand. When the cops come, they... He's standing there, he's laughing at us, the cops are like looking at us, and we be like, man, the white boy smacked us. When you called him white, you just called him the owner of the land, by law. And that's why the police treat you like you're a foreigner. This is the law. I'm not telling you what I think I know, I'm telling you the law. Right? So when you call, when you say, man, that white boy did it, why you fucking with us for? You just call him the sovereign. See, that's what magic and spells and spells, and spells is. Them niggas put magic and spells on us. And had us believing that we somebody that we really not. You know what I mean? That's why I tell people, I'm going to keep it a band. Like, I study independent study. I'm not a part of any temple, but I study. And I met a lot of Moors who was willing to study with me at the end of the day. I just did not agree with the one principle. I don't. Why do I got to join to learn about my own history and my birthright? It's mine's, right? And nothing against the temple. That's just my personal opinion. Right? Why do I got to join you? It's mine because the things I was learning, it kind of bothered me a little bit. But our history and the information we need to get out of this oppression is in the temple. That's facts. In the history, should I say. You know what I'm saying? So I bring this to y'all as an independent study or not. And, and I want to keep it 100 with you. Everybody listening to me, yo, you can check my who I am and look up my background and you can see Certain shit, like, you know what I'm saying? Me going to court, no lawyers, me getting locked to coming home, no bail, no nothing. Because it's all about what we understand. Now, I know I went away, I'm going to get back to it. What she's saying, because what she's saying is that the, the first word that she mentioned, I kind of won't, I try not to repeat it a lot because it'll get people in trouble if you say the wrong word. You know what I'm saying? That's why you got to study this. But the key is this, when, when we out there and the cops come, a lot of times the cop tells the superior what I was telling him. So if they do ask me, I just let them know I'm not Negro, black, or colored. You know what I'm saying? I'm a Moor. Now, whether you believe it or not, Obama did do some things for the Moors. He did nothing for black people. I want y'all to be clear with me. He did nothing for black people. But he did sign the rights to indigenous people that allow you to claim who you are, right? And, and in the human declarations of human rights, every man, woman, and child should not be arbitrarily deprived of a nationality. All of my people have been arbitrarily deprived. To be arbitrarily deprived means to be lied to since they were set free. Right? This is the declaration of human rights. All people, no, it says no man, woman, or child should be arbitrarily deprived of a nationality. Have, but most of us have never heard of the word nationality in our fucking life. We've heard race. You hear me? We heard race. When we when, when somebody come from Africa, do they say what color they are? Or do they tell you what part of the continent they came from and where their blood came from? Man, I'm from Congo. You know what I'm saying? I'm Liberian. Nigga don't say I'm African Liberian. 
They're going to say I'm African, you know what I'm saying, Egyptian. Them niggas don't, they don't say I'm African Nubia, they say I'm Nubian. And then we walk around America and then what we say? Oh, I'm African American. And you wonder why the Africans look at us like we fucking crazy because, you know, nationality means where do you come from? What continent does your ancestor come from? Something they didn't teach us in school. And in the documentary we were just watching when they said they thought about sending the Africans back to, I mean, the, us back to Africa. What they're not telling you is if you study law, you know why they didn't send the Africans back? Because univer because uh, international law states that you can't send the people to a land that they do not come from. It's against international law. Right? Hold on. Tell me I'm like. I'm going to flip it for a second. Hold on. It's something. This is something that we definitely, definitely got to have to understand as a foundation. Now, when I first started studying this, some of it made sense, some of it didn't. But the more I started sticking to it and the more like I actually been to court over this shit and represented myself. And the first time I did it, it was for um, they're trying to get me for child support. Right. Little man, I'm not being mine. And I knew I was already studying. So when they I, I went in the courtroom, I give you an example. I went in the courtroom. And so he was like, uh, he asked me, he was asking me certain questions. And like, I, I did everything where I went in there. And so he was like, yo, you going to give me a DNA. So I asked him, I said, are you asking me for the record? Because I'm not a felon, so by law, you're going to have to, uh, you need my permission, right? For the record. So, See, when you say for the record in the courtroom, you tell them the clerk to write it down. And so he got mad, and so they took me in the other room in Wake County. And so I sat down, they had two, like, um, they ain't even real sheriffs, y'all. By law, they're not real sheriffs. They took me in there, and they set me down, and they were trying to tell me that you're going to sign this paper, like on some bully shit. And I looked at the lady in child support, and I was like, by law, you cannot make me sign this. And she looked at them in their face, and she said, I can't make him sign this. And they took me back. They kind of roughed me up, but I opened the door so the people could see it. Like, just pushing me. And then they took me back. And so the first time I ever did it, I was a little nervous. So I did mess up. Only, it, it's not funny, but it's funny looking back on it now. Because at the end, I had the whole case. And he was like, I could take you to jail. And I was like, take me. But by law, watch what you say. Because I gave them sanction to arrest me. Now, to show you how powerful this shit is, even when I fucked up, Contempt come with what? 30, 60, 90, 120? I got six days. Now, on the sixth day, they bring you back to court to the same judge, which is, to me, should be kind of a conflict of interest because if y'all already had problems, right, then how the fuck are you going to stand up again? Because as soon as you start talking that shit, it go, you know what I mean? But I remember, because I said all this shit, right? And I told them before they arrested me, you violate international law. I'm not black, I'm a more. You know what I'm saying? And now, when they brought me to court the sixth day, it was a, I didn't have no representation. This black lady walked in the cell in Wake County. This is, I'm not lying to y'all, yo. If I ever knew who she was, she would speak up one day. And she, uh, she came in the cell and then she had a real sheriff because I asked for one. And he said, you asked for me, right? So if you think the law don't work, he asked me what happened. I told him I came in there and I told him he didn't have a right to um, ask me for my DNA. And then the sheriff said he didn't. You know what I mean? And so I explained to him and then the black lady was like, because that's what we know. She was like, yo, you're the first person in Wake County that ever represented yourself in this manner in child support court. And she was like, I'm impressed. You know what I'm saying? She was like, but listen, you can't fight from in here because of the way that they got you with this contempt. So she was like, when we go out here, you have to let, please let me represent you to just get you out of here. and You can use your brain to do more. And so I was smart enough. Like I went out there. It was a different judge. When I got out there, I'm like, shit, it's a different judge. But it was only a different judge because of what I asked for. And what I said, so when the Bible said you speak your existence, this is real shit. Just like people be afraid of police. I'm not afraid of police. I don't be rude. It's a way, like, you don't have to be rude. You just need to know law. Like, sir, they walk up on me and my friends. We outside. They get everybody else scared. They ask me, like, sir, what is your, what is your, what is your name? My name is Ibe. And they start asking you questions like, what is your address? I live in my body. My body live in the house. That's a legal answer. It's a federal lawsuit. This is facts. My body. This is a leak. You could, and ask niggas who've been me on the corner selling CDs. When they come up to me, yo, what's your address? Respectfully, sir. I live in my body. My body live in the house. It means that I know that I'm a spiritual being. Right? This is a legal answer. They can't do anything. It's not disrespectful. You don't have to be yelling. You know what I'm saying? But that's what this, this is what we going into about this lawsuit. Now, I will stop and break down certain things and make it more simplistic to my understanding. On the record, we come in with our flag, 
We come in with our treaty. We come in with the Constitution. We sign with them. And understanding that the Constitution is a contract. Be other than a minor, you have to be in your proper person at law. And how we write that is this. Bear with me for a minute and let me put this on. Because, uh, I'm trying to see if we already seen this. Yeah, hold on. A corporation that issues registry. With saying I am a U.S. citizen. Uh -uh. You cannot be a citizen and sit a bench. You cannot be a member of the Bar Association, which is a private, nonprofit corporation that issues registration numbers to its members who do not have a license to practice law in any state. Because in order to have a license to practice law, you must have your appropriate, proper person. And in order to be in appropriate persona in this country, whether that be North America, Central America, or South America, you must be a Moor. If they want to be sovereign, they've got to go home. They cannot be sovereign here. All right? All right, so when we say sovereign, so we can get a natural understanding for people watching now and people who come back and watch this for understanding. There's a confusion legally, and I want to make this clear. that The word sovereign, like if, if the cops come up on you and you say you are more, so there's a lot of more that's miseducated too. Because when the cops come up on you, you being miseducated if they walk up on you and you tell them that you're a sovereign. See, if you're a sovereign, you don't have to say it because to say you are more, that's your status. Meaning that to be a more, you are a sovereign. Meaning that your ancestors own the land and the soil that we own. Today, still. Right? So, a lot of times, a person, you hear more of, the, of people outside saying, like, man, I'm a sovereign. It's my land. When you say I'm a sovereign, they're going to associate you legally. They've been trained to call you a sovereign citizen. Now, a sovereign and a citizen are the opposites of each other. But if you're not educated, like a cop, I seen a cop, uh, what was probably a couple months ago, and he said something. I started talking. I told him I'm a more because you got to state it when they get there. Then he was like, I, I dealt with your people before. You know, I, I dealt with your type. You're talking to sovereign citizenship. But he would not let me talk. And when he finished, I said, respectfully, sir, but you have to let me finish speaking because you got a body cam on. And by law, what I don't say is my fault, not yours. So you can't stop me from speaking respectfully, right? And you have to let them know that because he called me a sovereign citizen. I said, sir, and not being rude, but a sovereign and a citizen are oxymorons. You cannot be an owner and be the person that rents at the same time. In the same house. It does not make sense. They're opposites of each other. So being a Moor, you know, is a sovereign. And I had somebody ask me the other day, they was like, well, what makes what makes you so special or, or dark skinned people that consider themselves Moors or black people that consider themselves Moors better than everybody else on the land? And my best explanation is this. And if you can't understand this, I'm sorry. But this is how it works. If if this land, the land is like your house and your like your house and the land that you own, if you own a thousand acres. If I bring my family over there and I'm from another land and I live over there and after a couple hundred years, they don't want to follow the rules no more. You know what I'm saying? Then you have the right to not want them on your land. But more importantly, the key to the law aspect, like I would tell a judge, do your children, does the people that you're allowing to stay on your land get the same privileges as the of the kids who land it is? That's why it worked this way. And it's just not America. We just, we're the indigenous people of this continent. You get what I'm saying? So that's what this law brings us. And when she said, that's why when you're a Moor, see, understanding the Moor, in, in the dictionary, the definition of Moor is any dark-skinned person, especially the African-American Negro. That's what the Heritage Dictionary say. The next issue of law is jurisdiction. Now, let me stick with status. What is the status of the prosecutor? What is the status of the district attorney? What is the status of Lynn Abraham? Does anybody in this room know her nationality? I don't. That's an important question to ask her if she serves me with any papers. Well, who are you? Where is your license to practice law? Where is your proof of naturalization in my land? Who gave you the authority to be here? Right? 
Who issued you authority to act in any capacity to file any complaint or any charges against anyone? See, when you really know your history, then you notice your shit. So the way you talk is not disrespectful. It's in the assertiveness with law being a protector. See, they can't say you're disrespectful when you're talking law. You see, you don't have to yell it at them. You know what I'm saying? So that's the point. I'm, and I'm bringing this back to something she said that I wanted to say to y'all. Hold on. Nationality? I don't. That's an important question to ask her if she serves me with any papers. Well, who are you? I'm going to give y'all a gift tonight. And most people that study who represent themselves do not get this aspect. Ch jurisdiction. Status, all right, because she's starting with status. Status is who are you? So when I was in court, I couldn't figure it out the first couple times what it meant to challenge jurisdiction. When the judge is calling my name and I'm sitting there and they're saying what they're saying to me and they're like, mister, they call me what my mother named me. And I say, for the record, my name is Abe. Uh, my mother named me, but she was ignorant. She didn't know law. Because ignorant means to not know. But you will call me Abe in this court because that is the name. And the next question that always comes out was, sir, uh, well, did you get your name changed? Did you, when you brought my ancestors here, did you take them one by one in court and change their names? They get quiet. These are legal answers. I'm not telling you nothing I haven't done before. You know what I'm saying? They get quiet. That kills that. See, when you in the courtroom, you're boxing. You know what I'm saying? And they don't really think we competent. But the reason why the courtroom was designed for a person to represent himself was because that the Moors, every every Moor, when Joe Washington got here, he wrote in them letters of how it was more no, it was more books and, and, and shit in their houses. It was more common to find books and, and, and libraries than it was to find stoves in their house. And there's a stove in every house. And it's more common to find books than it was to find a stove. So it was giving you an idea of how educated it was. So when you're dealing with status, status is who are you? So, for example, the judge come up and they call my name. How do you plead? Da, 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 and we go there. Now, as soon as I ask them, I ask them, uh, for the record, who are you? Excuse me, sir? For the record, can I ask you your name? What's your nationality? See, and if you ask them these questions, they're going to say, well, I'm white, I'm black. No, you're not, because you can't sit the bench, as she was telling you. An American citizen is not allowed to sit the bench. And if you're going by the Constitution, it states that it has to be a more that's on the bench. See, we don't read our own Constitution. You know what I'm saying? And it's certain parts of the Constitution that specifically states the rights of the Moors. But if they never told you or taught us anything about the Moors or never, you never had a clue that that's you, that's the greatest trick ever played on man right there. So everybody that's still in here, I want you to understand that this is the most deadliest thing that you can learn as a person, which is what? That you are somebody, that you actually exist, and it's a reason why you're being oppressed. If you black, you are cattle, Christian property, three-fifths. This is still the law. Three-fifths compromise. Your slaves can be three-fifths of a human. It's not fair. If you consider yourself black, then you're still cattle, legally. So they when if they feel like when they get mad that they cattle don't want to pay attention, they do what they they be shooting niggas in the street. And this is the legal representation of what's going on. Where is your license to practice law? Where is your proof of naturalization in my land? Who gave you the authority to be here? Right? Who issued you authority to act in any capacity to file any complaint or any charges against anyone? That's the question. And I say to you, she can't answer those questions, right? So then, if you go into a courtroom and nobody else has the status to be there, automatically challenge the jurisdiction of the court. There's nothing else that you need to say. There's nothing else to be said. Stand mute. Let them proceed because guess what? They cannot proceed. You have a question. How do we make them honor that information that you just passed on to us? In the courtroom, as I have learned because I've spent a lot of time there, right? There is a language of silence. After you've said what you need to say, don't say any more. 
They will do the rest when you stand on your square. That's all you need to do. There's no need to stand there and argue with the judge and judge. And trust me, I've done that. Let me let me give y'all a word of advice that anybody who really did this shit before. They're not going to just say, oh, yeah, you're right. And you can go home. Because remember, you're a free man in the court of slaves. And I had a conversation with my mans earlier, and I came to Epiphany. You know, like, you know how, like, being black in a moor is equivalent to, like, how you think they knew the difference between the free slaves and the... And the what was the difference between a, a black man that thought he was free and a black man that thought he was... That, that knew he was free? Because they never explained to us what was the difference between the free blacks in the north who had money and the blacks in the south or the blacks in the south that lived around it. So when you think about it, do you ever think that when they were stopping, nigga, where you going, nigga? He's like, I ain't black, I'm a moor. Oh, he a free man. Because to say that means you had to be educated to know that you were that you had a right to be walking around. So when you think about it, whether if it is or not, we got to ask ourselves during slavery, how did the so-called black people that were free identify themselves? That's your that's a quest for people that that has to be invested, investigated, I mean. You know what I mean? <laughs> All right. And once you say what you need to say, they know everything else to do. But understand, they do not want you exposing the truth to their corporate wards because every slave that you take out of their corporation, they lose money. This is a money making business. So don't go into the courtroom trying to expose the fraud. That's not your job. That's not why you're there. There's another venue for that. In that courtroom, because understand it's not court, because it's not law, and I'm going to get into that in a few minutes. So don't try to challenge them on the law. They already know that. Meaning that when you go, and I'm breaking it down to y'all this way so y'all understand. Don't, I did it before. Don't do that. If you go in there like, okay, don't go in there like Mr. Revolutionary or Mrs. Revolutionary and be like, oh yeah, well you ain't gonna tell these people back here who they really is and you da 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 and y'all frauds and don't come at it from the perspective like you trying to clown them because remember, they have a military and they did take over already so they have to honor the law but they're not gonna say yeah because the rest of the slaves sitting in the pews don't know what the hell you talking about. Let me tell you why. Let me explain. When you talking big law, niggas behind you don't know what you talking about. Yo, y'all think I'm bullshit. Real as shit in the world. Let me tell you, this is the shit. And I tell, I told my mother this shit. This is when I see the Uncle Tom come out of niggas unconsciously. I be in a courtroom, right? Let's say when they hit me for like driving without a license. And I keep beating these cases for, you know what I'm saying? Because I'm, I'm 34, I ain't never had a license. You know what I'm saying? So I just was smart enough not to get hit with that shit. So I'm sitting in the courtroom. So they say, all rise. I don't stand because if you stand up, jurisdiction is like, you know how when your son and daughter run past you and they doing something, and you be like, hey, what you doing? And they be like, ah, oh, mommy, I'm doing da da da. They just gave you jurisdiction by law because they answered you. So when the cops stop you and say, where you going? And you say, uh, you gave them jurisdiction. You ask the questions. Why did you stop me? You keep asking them and they never gain jurisdiction. It's hard for them to put a ticket or something. That's how law works. You know what I'm saying? So I'm in the court and they say, all oh, rise. I'm sitting there. Everybody stand up. I'm still sitting down. Every black person in arms reach front, back, left side of me. Be like, hey, boy, you better get your ass up. And I be like, yo, <laughs> I swear to y'all, listen, no bullshit. I be sitting every time. And be like, yo, you, yo, you better get up. They going to lock your ass up, nigga. And I be thinking to myself, like, I can see like it's like 100 years earlier. Like, boy, they going to hang your ass. That's how that shit be feeling. And every time the two sheriffs come over to me shooting they shit, sir, can I ask why you're not standing up? And see, this is where your mind has to come into play. I say, um, I say, can we step to the side? Because I know law and what I'm about to say to you, I don't want you to think that I'm trying to show you up in front of all these people. So can we step to the side? And when, and when they finally get me to the side, they look at me, they kind of have me in a corner and they be like, yeah, so what's your reasoning? And I'll be like, yo, I'm like, I'm a Moor. And it's a, and, and, and courtesy of um, Jagger Hoover, who classified the Moors as a religion instead of a nationality to cover it. It's a, that basically since he classified it as a religion, it's against my religion to stand in the courtroom. And they tell me, go sit down. Now, a couple things happen. They let everybody go before me and I go last. Or they ignore the shit out of me and I'm coming back every time. Like when they see my face now, they see me. They act like I ain't in the courtroom. You know how like you can get up and ask to speak to the DA? Not me. 
If I get up in the courtroom and be like, "Ask me the DA," the the the, uh, the the deputy sheriff be like, "Sit the fuck down." This I'm in front of people, sit down. And I'd be like, "Dad, I can't talk to the DA." They'd be like, "Nah." <laughs> After a while, see, you gonna understand that. I used to get mad, and then one day I realized, like, the reason why they doing this to me is because they want me to be mad, frustrated, angry, and upset by the time I get up here. But if I watch them, they're actually doing the funniest shit in the world. Like, you know what I mean? So that's the reason why I'm telling y'all that this shit that she's saying is 100% true. But remember, they're not just going to say yes. You know what I mean? So it's a boxing match. And what she means when she said, like, for example, the judge can ask a question and they can say something that's completely wrong. And the judge, see, it's so many people that come into court that don't really study, who just got these packets, who think they can do this shit. And that's what's making niggas look bad. But if you really know your shit, they'll say something to you. And like, what the judge said to me one day, you know what I'm saying? Like, um, it, it was saying something about like a subject, like you don't have jurisdiction. And he was like, I got subject matter jurisdiction. And like Taj always say, your dumb ass was like, oh, and get scared. But you both to say, yeah, for the record, what's the subject? And laugh because there's no such thing. And if he, and then that's when a lot of times you might laugh at the judge or he might say something. And you'd be like, huh, for the record, like, or, or for the, for example, when I ask them questions, like, when I say, who are you? What's your name and nationality? What country flag are you representing on my soil? When I know they, they're they going to lie. They can't tell you the truth. See, when you understand that they can't tell you because the oath they got, then they just lie to you. And as soon as they finish, I'll be like, let the record reflect what the judge said. Now she know that, I'm, that I understand what she just said and that we wrote it down in case I got to bring this up in federal court. This shit is obtainable to do for a human being. Law was, law was made for every individual, not for the lawyers. The word lawyer means liar in Latin. Let's get back to it. They already know they don't have the proper status. They already know they're operating in your land fraudulently. All right? Just say what you have to say and back off. They will give you the window. And it's up to you, if you are educated enough about the law, you'll see the window, you'll recognize it, and then you'll be able to walk through it and walk out the door. But if you're not conscious, when they open the window for you, I'll give you an example. As I gave in class just a few nights ago, uh, went into the courtroom and the judge has papers there in front of me and he's just arguing with me, young lady, you'd better come back here. I'm going to send all these officers I have at my disposal with guns to hunt you down and bring you... And he's just running his mouth. And the prosecutor slides me the paper to sign. And the, it was blank. Do you understand? Do you understand? Yes, so I signed the paper because I know how to sign contracts and not be obligated to them. All rights reserved. Yo, I hope y'all writing this shit down that I'm telling y'all tonight, because this is real shit I'm telling y'all. what that? How you sign a contract? Like, when you go to the store, y'all don't think it's weird? Like, you go here, see that they be like, yeah, well, you want to get a thing? We want your name and your signature. So whenever I sign something, the first thing you're supposed to say, and this shit will bug you the fuck out. You know, we done got, we're so sleep that we don't, we don't even ask questions. Like, when we go to work, when they give me a piece of paper when I was working and shit, they say, ask me questions. And I'd be like, well, do I got to sign? Well, do, do I have to sign this legally? And watch the answers you get at work. Well, no, but we would like for you to sign it. And then in school, when I'm, I'm approving, anybody that's live probably going to feel dumb as hell, but laugh. Listen. You remember when we was little kids in kindergarten and they said, these are social security numbers? Do not give them to anybody. Nobody. And everywhere we go, they ask for our social security numbers and we just sign it up there. That's why we fucked up. Not paying attention. Right? So I did that, signed the blank piece of paper. They took a copy, I took a copy, and I left. And I never heard from them again. But if I had stood there, as I shared with class, and I have done this, this paper is blank and I'm not signing it. And right so all i had to do was come into the courtroom and say what i had to say now i know how to present myself in the courtroom islam meaning that one day i was in the courtroom and i said something and they was like yo like she's told me at the end of the case she was like guilty and i was fucked up because i know i did this shit like i know and she was like guilty and when they said guilty after this case it was for a driving out a license I was about to say something to her like, yo, how you going to find me guilty 
right? But right when I was about to say something, two sheriffs walked up and said, get out. But what I realized is earlier that day, I watched everybody that came into Dunn, into in Johnson County courtroom, because I was out there. When they came in, every time the case was over, they was like, yo, and your court cost is $230. And they was like, do you got the cash? Or do you, it's an ATM outside, or do you need to go get it? Right? And I was like, damn. So when they told me, to, when she was like guilty, and da 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 da, they walked up and told me to leave. And I was about to ask them, like, yo, like, just wondering, like, how? How could you just not follow the law? And I thought about it. Like, they didn't ask me for, did I have court costs or nothing? I got the fuck up out of there. That's the window. Or one time, my homeboy, they told him he went in the court. I ain't gonna say his name. And he was like, Jersey, I'm fucked up. And I said, yo, just listen, da da da. He went in there and he said he ain't even do it right. And then he was like, he just he just said a couple things. And in, in the middle of the case, the, the judge said to him, so so sign this paper right here if you want uh if so sign I, we need you to sign this people piece of paper saying that you don't want the court's help. They're not gonna say, Oh yeah, you're right, because they can't afford for the other hundred people behind them to, you know what I mean? But they'll respect you, but you have to, it's not about how smart you are, it's about you making them believe that you really understand what's going on and that you understand law. All right? And see the window and walk out. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, the next issue at law is jurisdiction. We already know they don't have the status. Now, do they have the jurisdiction? The answer is no. Because in order to have jurisdiction, you must first prove status. Everybody in the courtroom must have status on the record. Why is that so important? Because unless their status is on the record, what, what country do you represent? Says what law you're here to um, get justice on, right? Now, if, if you have not clarified the status for the record, you can't bring your law into the court. Now, I want you to understand that the other day, not the other day, like two months ago when, I, when the cops had came and I was talking to them, that when I told you he wouldn't let me speak, he was saying, when I told him I was a Moor, and I told him, like, you know what I'm saying? He said, he said yo, we don't deal with, um, he said, we don't, we don't deal with, how did he say it? We don't deal with, we don't deal with law, we deal with, like, statutes, or we don't deal with it, you know what I'm saying? Or we don't deal with, he said, we don't deal with nationality, we deal with law. And I was like, well, how is that possible? You know what I mean? And then he was like, and then the, and the white cop that was with him, was like, they was like, they didn't know what I was talking about. See, they'll act like they don't know what a moor is. They're trained. So I'm a moor, and they're like, they don't know what it is. So I said, so. And so I asked the other cop. He wasn't really black, but he was dark. I said, what's your nationality? He said, oh, I'm Samoan. And I said, oh, so you can, so it's okay for your people to have a nationality and come from a continent, but my people can't have none. And they got quiet. I'm telling y'all the game that these motherfuckers is playing. And if he black and he on the police force, not all of them bad, but a lot of them already gave up their masculinity to the police academy. You know what I'm saying? That's who they loyal to. So I'm just being real with you. So, And when I told him, I said, how can nationality not be involved in law? He said, what do you mean? I said, because if I get into it, I get in a fight with a European, if we go to court, we have to know, I have to know what his nation, what nation he comes from. Why? Because we might have treaties. We might have things that our ancestors signed that said, in case we ever get in a fight, instead of us doing going crazy, we just need to shake hands. And we do have a treaty with certain nations like the European called the Treaty of Friendship and Peace. That was signed two years before slavery ended. And the Moors were the people who was building Washington, D.C. It's so much more to the story. It's your job to find out what happened. If you let people, it's, it's a reason why they call the Moors the great race traders, because they want you to discredit them. But why do they spend so much energy trying to get you to look at them? Yeah, I don't care what people you look up on the planet, they all got some fucked up shit about them. But you need to understand that why are they never telling you these things? Status for the record, you can't bring your law into the court. So there can be no court. So status is very important. And so it, it, if you're more, and let's say somebody else is Manchurian, and I'll get to that in a minute. When you have two people of different standings in the courtroom, you have to decide what law applies. Is there a treaty between the two? Do they have a constitution? Do they have any other trade agreement or contract that binds them and obligates the parties? That's the question. All right. So if you walk into the courtroom and they immediately start adjudicating, you have no idea what law they're using. And I guarantee you, because status has not been established for the record, they're not using any law that applies to you. 
And they're not using any law that applies to them. They're simply using corporate policy, which is discretionary. If they like you today, they'll let you off. If they don't like you tomorrow, they'll give you some time or a fine. Okay? So status and then jurisdiction. Jurisdiction is going to determine what area, what geographical area encompasses the authority that that judge or that court has. All right? So if you're in a municipal court or a court of common pleas, don't go in there talking about the Constitution because they don't have jurisdiction to discuss the Constitution with you. Do not go into a state court discussing the Constitution unless it's the state's Constitution because the United States' is the Constitution they have no jurisdiction over, but they won't tell you that. They'll dismiss the case. Different jurisdictions. And don't go into federal court talking about city ordinances. You understand the difference? Meaning that depending on where you live, there's certain laws that apply. Separation between church and state. But you think when they say that, that they're talking about church meaning like religious. No. A, a, a state is a, a... The courthouse is a state. A public school is a state. Anywhere where a group of people gather is like a corporation. That is a state legally. See, we have no understanding what the word state means. And that's the key. So when she's saying if we in North Carolina state court, you better not be talking federal law in there. You know what I'm saying? Or that's how they're gonna be dealing. If you in, if you in, if you dealing in city court, you know what I mean? You gotta understand which style of law that you're in to be able to fight and be able to deal with. You know what I mean? Difference. Okay. Jurisdiction. Then adjudication. Once you get to the part about adjudication, you have to ask the question: Do you understand the law that applies to you that applies to this matter? Because there's two types of jurisdiction, jurisdiction over the matter and jurisdiction over the person. All right? Does the court have both? They must have both in order to proceed. They don't tell you these things, but this is very important. So if the court has gotten to the point of adjudication, all right, which for me, I don't have that problem. But once the court gets to the point of adjudication, then they're ready to start prosecuting. They're ready to find you guilty of something, some kind of way. And the reason for that is because it's a business. And once you enter there and they seize jurisdiction over you, they adjudicate for the sole purpose of getting some money. That's, that's the bottom line. They don't care about you, whether you're innocent or whether you're guilty, none of that. How much? How the hell, if, and that's true, let me explain because how the hell do you have a, a $500 lawyer and then how do you have a million dollar lawyer that can get you off any case unless the law is bullshit and it's all about politics? There's no difference between a clerk at McDonald's and the clerk at the courthouse. All they care about is getting money from you or your lawyer getting money. You pay your lawyer, your lawyer don't really, he, he handles law. But where really he goes and has lunch, you pay him, like, I'm going to need like three payments that's going to come up to like, you know, $6,000 or you can break them down into 10 payments. You go to court, they spread it out through like six months at a time so you can get payments. By the time you about done paying, he go have lunch, he take a little bit of that money, he give it to the judge, he say, look, you remember that favor I needed from when your son got in trouble when he was younger that my dad did for you? I'm going to need that favor, you know? And then he come back and he'll call you like, oh, yeah, you know that that case you had years ago? Man, I got it dropped. You know what I'm saying? You be like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I ain't got to go to court. No, it's dropped. I bring the paperwork over. How much money are they going to get out of this? And, if, and their little club that they have called the Bar Association, their members have to be fed. So they want to make sure that this one gets fed and that one gets fed. And that's fine because that's their corporate thing. That's the way they make money. And if they're going to make money being deceitful and all that, that's the karmic baggage they've got to carry. But you don't want to be a participant to it. That's all. Okay. Color of law. Colorable color means something that pretends to be something that it's not. Colorable court. Colorable money. Colorable law. Colorable people. Any people who call themselves colored. Negro. African American. Indian, Puerto Rican, Chinese, Australian, all of these are colorable labels, but these people for the most part around the world don't even know this. But because they call themselves Chinese, as I was getting ready to say to you, they are part of a corporate nation state as well because the country of China is Manchuria, the nation state. The corporate ward nation state is China. That is not the country or the sovereignty of the people. The people are Manchurian, all right? You understand? 
Say anybody who wants to call themselves Puerto Rican. Puerto Rico is a corporate nation state. It is a private, nonprofit corporation that has a charter issued by the Moors where they have the, the authority to conduct commerce and trade on the island of Borncano. Borncua, right? Borncua. That's the name of the people. Borncano is the name of the island. Puerto Rico is the private nonprofit corporation that has the charter to operate within the geographical boundaries of Borncano. So America is Morocco, or a Moroccan, but the corporate state that colonized, or the business that's running this land, is what we call America. But the people aren't Americans, not the dark skinned ones, they're Moors. There was a treaty signed between the, the king of the Moors and um, a, a, a king, uh, uh, Abdullah, I want to mispronounce his name, but he made them sign a treaty saying that the Moors can never be an Americans and Americans can never be Moors. Yo, I got the paperwork. Inbox me y'all Gmails. And I got to go through my history because I used to send it to people, like the treaty, the, the treaty of Peace and Friendship and all of that. You know what I mean? But that's what it's saying. The people in China, they're not Chinese, they're Manchurian. But as long as they agree, when as long as they call themselves Chinese, they're going to get mistreated by the government. And just like the people in the, the Darcy people in America, they're not, they're not black. They're Moors. You know what I'm saying? But as long as they call themselves black, they're going to get mistreated because they're out of their natural person. You know what I mean? There is no... And basically what it's saying is that in the United Nations, there's a list of all of the human beings on the earth that come with a flag. Black man does not exist. Chinese does not exist. You know what I mean? So that's why they never come and fight these governments for doing their people wrong. Because the people got to first identify themselves back to the land. You know what I'm saying? Most Puerto Ricans don't even know that. I go around telling people all the time, you're not this, you're not that. This is who you really are because people have grown into, grown up into slavery for generation after generation in all these corporate nation states who belong to the United Nations, which is a private nonprofit corporation trade association for nation state corporations. Got it? In order to belong to the United Nations, you have to be a corporate ward state, nation state. Otherwise, they don't want you. And they will go to war against a country and take the people out of their sovereign capacity and say they're setting up democracy all around the world so that they can take people out of their sovereign capacity and take them away from the law and impose corporate statute on them. And that's exactly what they do. All right? Now, color of law is in full swing. And this is the last thing because I kind of didn't say it. Color. The word in the law book, the word color means fake. From distinguished from what is not real. So the word color, when you say we color people, you be saying the fake people by law. The word color means fake. So that's why, like, for example, I was in court one day, right? And I asked the judge, like, yo, this is, I said, for the record, this is color of law. And she looked at me and she was like, there's a lot of colorable people in the room. And I smiled at her. And then she smiled back and then she kept going. You know what I'm saying? But she was letting me know to see if I understood that, that if I really understood what she meant. And she was telling me that all these people in the courtroom are fake. This guy thinks he's white. This guy thinks he's black. You know what I'm saying? So the judge told me this in front of everybody, but only the understanding knows. All around the world all around the world and they have a clique where they're all intermingled and they all agree to participate together in this game right now it doesn't matter where you go just like most people think you need a passport to travel from company to company to company that are called nation states so you do need a passport if you call yourself black or african-american or a u.s citizen or any of those things yes you need a passport to travel from one corporate nation state to another but when you're traveling from one country to another, you do not need a passport. And those countries will tell you you don't. Depends on what you call yourself. I went to the airport with my homeboy. So we was having this argument one day about three years ago. And, they, and, and I was driving them up at the airport and I was telling them this. And these niggas laughed at me like I was stupid. So when we got to the register, right, he got his tickets or whatever. And I was like, yo, I told I said, I'm a more. And my friends are laughing. Oh, they was laughing. I didn't even tell her. I said, I'm a mom. I don't need a passport. And they laughing at me. You hear this nigga? And the clerk leans over and says, 
And they was like, do you hear him sounding all crazy? And she looked at us and she said, well, depending on what you call yourself. And she walked the fuck off. You understand? Okay. Why do we have colorable law and colorable courts? During the Civil War, the Moors went to war against each other. Now, we destroyed ourselves in this. The, the Europeans did not come here and bring us down. We did that from inside, and they capitalized on the carnage. Do you understand? All of these buildings all around here, as I told in class last night, they're ours, they belong to us. They're ancient, these buildings. There's a whole city underneath this city. They've been burned all the major cities, the major energy centers on this globe we call an earth. Our ancestors set up these energy centers that we call Philadelphia, New York, Boston, Atlanta, Detroit, right? Chicago, Miami, Phoenix, Los Angeles, they are energy centers. They're not where they are in huge, large cities just because of some coincidence. There's energy and power in these places. London, Rio de Janeiro, all right? And, and by the way, we're gonna spell it like this, Rio de. De, which is a normal title of the Moors. Rio de Janeiro, you understand? This thing is worldwide. This flag that we carry with the red flag, with the five-pointed green star, with the pointing up, all right, is a worldwide flag. It's recognized all around the world, all right? So the reason we have colorable courts and colorable law is because during the Civil War, when the Moors warred against each other, there were those who agreed to participate in the game called the corporate ward game. And there were many who made a lot of money. They got a commission on everybody they got to sign a birth certificate because the birth certificate is a contract that puts you in slavery. And they got money. William Penn got very rich, all right? All the Quakers got very rich. All the abolitionists got very rich on this Civil War ward state game. Robert Morris and a lot of these buildings that are named after these people in downtown Philadelphia became multimillionaires, and their ancestors are still wealthy today over the corporate ward game. All right? Now, the reason that we have to have colorable law and colorable courts is because so many of us agree to be slaves. We don't need colorable courts and colorable law otherwise. But the people who agree to be bound by the 14th Amendment, which covers civil rights, which covers Negroes and African Americans and Jews and Hispanics and Indians and all these people like that, if you agree to call yourself that, they have to create a statute that applies to you because law doesn't apply to you. So it's not their fault. It's the fault of the people who agree to be outside of their sovereign capacity. Okay? And now, if you walk in and you want to reestablish it, they're at odds because they're not, they're not accustomed to people walking in who are conscious and sovereign. There's, hey, you can't separate the two when you walk into a courtroom. And when I say you walk in on your square, I don't stand in with your feet at a right angle. All right? I mean that not to be deterred when you know you're in and you have law on your side, do not back down. But you do not have to be belligerent. Trust me, I've been there. Don't do that. Okay? Now, the law of the land. The law of the land as it applies to the United States of America and the United States is their constitution. The law of the land, which supersedes that, which if you go and read the supremacy clause of the Constitution, you will see that the treaty, in particular the Treaty of 1787, which was last, which was last signed and ratified in 1986, all right, it's re-signed every 50 years, that it's the treaty that is the actual law of the land. Now, that being the case, how do we make that treaty work for us. We always say they are not honoring the treaty. This is the oldest treaty in the world. Did y'all know that? And it's the only unbroken and longest standing treaty in the world. Did y'all know that? Now, that treaty protects us. You need to go get a copy of it, the Treaty of Peace and Friendship of 1787, all right? Signed by the Emperor of Morocco. Actually, he signed it in the year, in the month of Ramadan, in the year 12, 1201, all right, which translates into the Gregorian calendar year of 1787 because they added 586 years to our calendar, all right? 
So in terms of using the law of the land and when you express these things to them, you don't even have to uh, go into a lot of detail about it because those who rule and those in government and those who sit on those judicial benches know what this doctrine is and they adhere to it. But the problem is there's not enough of us standing up defending it. Okay? How to correct the issue? The people must must be in their proper person. The people must act in their sovereign capacity. As the brother said earlier, how do you behave as a sovereign? How do you behave as a sovereign? You behave as a sovereign by not getting so upset and ranting and raving and causing a scene. There's no need to do any of that. As I said in the courtroom, as in with law enforcement and any of that, there's a language of silence. Just like the mummers who march down Broad Street every New Year's and they're playing it up and playing it up. What does mummery mean? Silent mockery. Who are they mocking? Us. All right? But they understand the language of silence and they, and they deal in it all the time with their secret signs and symbols. But don't be angry with them for using these things. Why not? We taught it to them. Okay? Don't be angry with them because they have gotten out of control with the power that we gave them. We created these people. We can't now, now turn around and say, now we don't want you, now you know, go off someplace else and this and that. And if you know the history, you know that the Moors, what the Moors did to these people when they were first created. The Moors considered them subhuman. They couldn't speak Latin, which is our original language. They couldn't go to school, they couldn't own land, they couldn't vote. They were totally disenfranchised. And this is why the Moors commissioned, um, commissioned Benjamin Bay, who you know as Benjamin Banneker, who is also Benjamin Franklin, by the way, okay, to teach these people the science of government. He did that for a select few. Unfortunately, it couldn't go and spread as widely as it should have been. Now we have a situation on our hands where we as Moors refuse to be who we are. In the civil rights movement, there were those who led it who were paid to get us off our square, and we agreed to be there. We agreed to be called black, and we're proud of it, remember? Now, who could tell us any different? Now, the Europeans have a dilemma because they've lied to us so much and we have forgotten so much that if they stand up to tell us the truth, would we believe them? The majority of the people who call themselves African-American right now, if you tell them they're not from Africa, they'll give you hell. Am I right? Yes, we are. <laughs> now, can you imagine they're getting, you're getting that feedback from them? Can you imagine what they would say to a European who now try to tell them they're not from Africa? You understand? Now you've got Bill Gates who's given a billion dollars to the United Negro College Fund, you know, to keep more Negroes out of their sovereign capacity. And they jump right into the boat, right? Play it up to the hill. Oh, what a great thing he's done. You know, they love him to death. Now, if the Moors try to stand up and say well, who the man really is, you got all these black people who are going to criticize you. Leave the man alone, they'll say. All right? But we know the truth. So we correct the issue only by standing on our square, whether we're Moors or whether we're not. All right? Now, let's talk about what law really is. Law is based upon the science, the science of astrology, astrologic. Don't let anybody ever tell you that astrology is for entertainment purposes. It is the science that rules. It is the science that governs. As I said to you, what all law is, all law. All law. Do we praise all law? Absolutely. Do we praise Christ? Absolutely. Because what, what, not who. What is Christ? Christ is the great I am. And if you know what Islam means, let me tell you this. Self, law, am, 
master. I am the master of my own fate. I am all law. All right? When you walk into the courtroom and you know these things, trust me, you get a different result. When they ask you your name, you never say, my name is. That's a label. What do you say? I am. I am. You never swear on the Bible. You affirm. You affirm on the Bible. And, and they're telling you the truth. I was, uh, in one of the cases I told you about when I had to go, because it was for like, he claimed I ran a, a, a stop sign or whatever, and they couldn't get me on the driver, so they are trying to get me on that. And so when I got on the stand for my part, they gave me, they brought the Bible to me. <clears throat> and as more as we don't, you're not going to swear on the Bible. So you don't have to. You know what I'm saying? And when they brought it to me, I said, I don't, I don't swear, but I affirm. And they didn't make me put my hand on the Bible. And as Sister Thana here said to me, oh, they try to trick you. They'll say, do you swear or affirm? <laughs> no. You just say, I affirm. Because what? I am and who you are and that's your status and nobody can compete with that nobody can take that from you and no matter what paperwork you submit to a court what is the most important thing is when you walk into a courtroom and you speak the law and when you speak the law in a courtroom guess what you speak it into existence because a thought is an activity it's real it may not be something you can touch but as soon as that thought transpires into a word, it becomes a spell. That's why they call it spelling. You get it? Now, law is based upon the zodiac. Now, when you walk into a courtroom, there's all kinds of things going on. There's sacred geometry going on in the courtroom. In fact, the courtroom is set up according to sacred geometry. All right? And here's what happens when you're in there. The judge is at the top of the triangle. Got it? When you walk in there, and as I had shared in another class, to deal with marriage, it's the same thing. And I'm going to talk about that also in a minute. You walk in there, and when you appear, never tell the court that you are appearing. Look in the law dictionary and find out the definition of appear. Never do that. You go into the courtroom and you make a what? A special appearance. Not general. That will get you in trouble every time if you appear in a courtroom. And all of these little nuances, they know these things. And they are put there to trap you who don't know. So when you walk in there and you're on your square, being on your square means to know these things and not to walk in the courtroom uncomfortable. Because when you know them, you have no reason not to come to court, do you? You want to be there because you want to make a special appearance to challenge the jurisdiction of the court. Why? Because of the lack of status. And once jurisdiction is challenged, it must be proven for the record. It must be proven for the record before the court can proceed. Do you understand? The judge must come with his nationality papers. He must come with the flag of the country, not the nation state that he represents. That United States flag with the 50 stars, which now should be 48 because there are only 48 states. Did y'all know that? Two of them dropped out, Hawaii and Alaska are no, more, are no longer states. Did y'all know that? They're no, longer, they're no longer states. The treaty was up. They got out. All right. I'm kind of going through a lot of things right now, and, okay. Uh, 
All right. The law is used by people in their proper person. When you walk into the courtroom, you should always have your paperwork precede you. Don't walk in there without first having submitted some document to the court to let them know that, yes, I'm coming. And, and look in the law dictionary and look up the definition of come. It's different than appear. Now, you can come to the courtroom, all right, and make a special appearance. You understand? Never, never, they, you get the subpoena, whatever it is in the newspaper, and don't believe all this other stuff where they tell you, don't go to court if you get these papers, because they will put a manhunt out for you, and you do not need that, and there's no reason for you not to go. You should go. You should go, and the more of us that do go and challenge the jurisdiction and let them see, we're not scared because we're standing on the square. They will stop calling you. <laughs> to court, all right? Because the people who operate in their proper person and the more and more of us that go in there operating in our proper person, they're gonna begin to see the game is up. The secret's out. We can't do this anymore, all right? Justice died upon the cross. What does that mean? I'm no artist. That is the cardinal point of the zodiac. Cardinal, as in Catholic Church, cardinal. They are your deacons of the zodiac. Deacons, as in the Christian Church. They are your cardinal points. And they apply to everything you do. Who you are, your character, everything that surrounds you, your environment, the country where you live, everything is affected by the different signs of the zodiac. When justice died on the cross, here's what happened. That's our solar system, and that's the sun in the middle. And that's Earth, the third rock from the sun, which is its planetary position. That's not its name. And its planetary position will be changing, is changing every day. And it's speeding up and getting closer and closer to the sun until it will occupy the second position, rock from the sun. This is the natural life cycle of a planet. And all the planets are coming in, and then more planets are being created out further beyond Pluto. So what they call the greenhouse effect is the natural heating up of the planet. And all those who cannot meet the heat requirement as the planet heats up will be eliminated from the planet. This is the science of the zodiac. Now, just like we have the zodiac, which I just showed you, based upon what is called the geocentric form of astrology. Geocentric because it's centered based on the Earth as its center point. Then there's the heliocentric form of astrology, which is based upon the sun being the center. Sun is helio, Earth is geo. Everybody understand that? Now, just like we have our signs applied to the earth here, the sun also has its center point here. Everybody understand that? Does everybody understand that our entire solar system is spinning around the Milky Way? The earth spins on its axis, the moon spins on, right, spins around, well, let me back up. The moon doesn't spin around the earth like they told you, but the moon does have a cycle. Now. The earth spins on its axis and the earth spins around the sun. 
the sun spins on its axis and this entire solar system spins around the Milky Way. Everybody understand that? That's, that's basic, right? Very basic. Now, check this out. It takes the sun 26,000 years to make one revolution around the Milky Way. Everybody understand that? This, I'm not, this is a science here. I'm not trying to make up stuff just to, just to lie to you, okay? And all of this, believe it or not, is relative to law. That's why I'm explaining it to you, all right? And we talk, the subject is justice died upon the cross. So I'm coming back to that, but I have to give you this information first so you'll understand. 26,000 years for the sun to make one journey around the Milky Way, all right? If we divide that by 12, why are we dividing it by 12? There are 12 signs of the zodiac, all right? Now, if we divide it by 12, this is the number. Two thousand one hundred sixty six years. So our solar system spends two thousand one hundred and sixty six years in one sign. We just left the age of Pisces and age is equal to two thousand one hundred and sixty six years. Now you've heard the term an age, but nobody ever thought about it. We say for ages, what's an age equal to? Mathematically, it's equal to 2,166 years. Got it? Now, we just entered the age of Aquarius. All right, 2,166 is represented here. See that? So each one, right, has a time frame of 2,166. Everybody understand that? Here's what happens. I don't need to write all of them, right? You all understand the point. We just left the age of Pisces which was, or an eon, an age and an eon are equal to 2,166 years. Now, we just left the age of Pisces, which is represented by what we know as Jesus. This is why Jesus is represented by the sign of the fish. It's over. The age of Pisces is over, all right? Not to come around again until we go through all of the other 11 signs of the zodiac. Now we're in the age of Aquarius. What does that mean? Justice, and any Mason will tell you, if he can unravel the allegory, is Jesus. Jesus was born, why? Because what's the opposite of, of Pisces? Jesus was born of a virgin mother. Virgo is the virgin. Virgo is the virgin, right? Who in here is Virgo? Anybody? Virgo is the virgin, right? Okay. So Jesus was born of the virgin mother, Virgo. Got it? All of this stuff in the Bible, because understand that the Bible is not a religious book. The Quran is not a religious book. They are science books. Biblios Heliotech is the Bible. It's the full Latin name of the Bible. It is the science. It's an elementary science where Moors are concerned. It's the science of the study of the cycle of the sun. Helio meaning study, meaning sun. Biblios meaning record of. Y'all understand? The Quran, Quran, chronology, chronology, maxima, the great chronology. The Quran is the great chronology of the science and the study of the asteroid, of the astral plane. You understand? Okay, so justice died on the cross. Here's what happened. Those that we call Europeans or Albions, Europeans or Albions ruled during the age of Pisces. So when we say the time is up, we're not just, just saying this by conjecture. We're saying this because the time, the 2,166 years that they had is over. 
I'm not saying this because I have any bias against them or any of that. This is the science of it, and they know it. The problem is our people are not ready for it. <laughs> how, how can justice return under the age of Aquarius if we are not ready? The age of Aquarius demands information. It is the technology age Aquarius is. Aquarius demands answers. Our youth demand answers. They demand the truth. They demand this truth because they cannot proceed and lead the world without this knowledge. They cannot do it. They cannot do this without the understanding of the zodiac, which is this. Zodiacus is the ancient name of the term zodiac. Zodiacus implies the first woman, who is this. Womb man. We are man with a womb. That's who we are. No spirit can enter this plane without the agreement of a womb man. Period. We are the vehicle. We have a covenant with the cosmos where we agree to bring those spirits, which we call monads, from the astral plane and summon them to this physical plane. And it is only through the womb man that they can leave, exit, and then reposition themselves in another plane. All of this relevant to all law. Now, this is why when the brother talked about getting our land back, I know this issue very well. I fight this fight every day on top of all my other duties and responsibilities and everything else that I do. So when we talk about justice returns under the age of Aquarius, this is why when we walk into a courtroom and we understand that the court, as I explained to a class just recently, a court is also a corporation. They don't hide that from you. They put it right on the seal, right behind the judge. And they tell you that this court was incorporated in 1878, whatever it is. This court was incorporated, and, and what words do they use? Founded. So when you see the word founded, and you see the word established in, it already tells you that they're a corporation. Understand? And anybody- Not only that, but like in Wake County Court, it was like established in 1873. And you never think to ask yourself, so what the fuck was going on before that? So there was no courtrooms before this? This is crazy. Or not like this. Like they, they tell you that they just got into law during the 1800s. And the African was doing that shit for thousands of years. Anybody who owns a corporation does what? Own a slave. Because a corporation is a slave holder. Y'all be running around here praising Jay-Z like he that nigga. But... If you know the business, he's a slaveholder because Rock Nation is a just a small piece of Live Nation. Live Nation is the company of the corporation with the rich people that's not black people who control all the touring around the world. That's why it's hard to tour if you don't have a record deal because they want you in their circle. You know what I mean? So what Jay did was say, shit, how about I make another sub company and then because of my popularity, I get all of the rappers who want my wealth to sign to me and I just promise them they could be rich like me one day. But all he did was middleman them and he go, he, his deal is with Live Nation. So instead of them going straight to Live Nation, he getting paid off every nigga. Understand? Now, let's talk about the issues that come up in court. How am I with time, uh, Noah? All right. <laughs> the point I want to make real quick um, relative to going to court and getting land back and all these issues and all these injustices that have been done to us, when we... Uh, participate in organizations that take us off our square, that adds to the chaos and the confusion. So it's better not to join anything at all and just be yourself if you are not going to be a more. But if you, even if you're going to be a more, understand that sovereignty is an individual thing. Don't go into court talking about, I belong to such and such organization.
And be clear about that because as soon as you say an association, an organization, a business, a firm, a corporate, you're talking about slavery. And they love that language because you're putting yourself right in their jurisdiction as soon as you say it. But you go in there and say, I am. Well, what organization do you belong to? Well, none. They do not know how to deal with you. But as soon as you say corporation, because they're a corporation and they speak the corporate language and they have corporate policy, they'll love you to say that. So the first thing they're going to do is, hmm, how are we going to get some money? All right? Because that's the, that's the name of the game, money. Now, let's talk about who they are, why they exist, these courts. First of all, we know they're not really courts. We know they're colorable. They know they're colorable. They have to be colorable because they're dealing with colorable people, right? If we choose not to be colorable, we don't belong in there. So the court is this. Just like the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, just like the Bar Association, just like the United States of America, they are this. And the Bar Association, the bar is in London. So they're not even giving a fuck about American people. They're loyal to another country. They are a private nonprofit corporation. If you get some mail that belongs to me, do you go and show up and say you're me? No, you, you can't do that. So if a private nonprofit corporation sends you a document and you have no contract with them, why should you go up and debate the contract? Because if you don't have a contract, right? You Let me give you an example so it makes sense when she said if you don't have a contract. I'm 34 years old, I've never had a driver's license in my life. If you know me, hell yeah, I'd be on the road. Hell yeah, I've been to court a few times. Hell no, I don't go to jail. Let me explain why. I studied law, so I let them know I had a right to travel. And so the cops would say, or the judge said, well, that, you have the right to travel, but you can't be on highways. No, I had a right to locomotion on public road or highway. Everything I'm telling you is legal term, right? Now, through everything, they argue with me back and forth. After my 9, 10, because I always bring, like, extra cases to fight them with to say, you know, give them different reasons. Because you never want to come with one thing. And if they turn me down on every one, my last argument, which is the most powerful argument, is, well, for the record, can you present the contract that I signed that gave, where did I, I never went to the corporation called the uh, Department of Motor Vehicles, and I never signed over my birthright to drive on this soil. So I have no problem with complying with the state's uh, request if you can apply me the contract that I signed with the Department of Motor Vehicles saying they had the right to regulate my traveling on the soil that my ancestors are connected to. That's the question. You don't have a contract? You don't have a contract. It's as simple as that. You don't need to go there and say all that. Just say, because here's my status and this and that and the other, right? Don't go in there trying to debate whether you owe money on the contract or not. Um, the bill was too high and all that. And I'm not saying that because of what you said. Un understand that. If you don't have the contract, why are you discussing the bill? It doesn't make sense, does it? First, you have to have a contract. So the first thing you need to understand when you walk in there, I don't care what the issue is. Here's the question. And, and I write things down, specific things I write down, because when I write them down, I'm spelling, understand? Do we have a contract? Mm. If I rescind my birth certificate, do I? agreed to belong to the corporate war state that calls itself the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, which is a private nonprofit corporation. If I don't have a birth certificate with you, what agreement do we have that you should summon me to answer anything, right? If I don't have an agreement with the parking authority, which I don't, do they have the right to send me a bill saying that I owe them for a parking ticket? It is, it's ludicrous. Now, the thing to say is, if, if you don't have the contract, you have certain rights, and you need to exercise those rights. And there are codes even that are there, and laws that are there to protect you if you don't have a contract with somebody and they're trying to make you adhere to a contract. So, I got caught. So, I'll give you an example. I got caught with a, they, they charged me with a driver out of license when I was about 19. 
right? I caught another one at about 24, then another one at like 27. I think another one at like 29, 30, right? And it was like, um, the problem is before I knew law or was studying, I used to go there and they would always be talking to me. And then in the middle of them thinking about what they about to do, I would tell the DA, well, I never had a license before. And every time she'd say, huh? And then they'll say, well, hold on, go take a seat. And then she'll go talk to the judge and come back and be like, well, we'll give you uh, eight months to go get your license. And they would always do this. They would never charge me, but they would send me back. So one time, years later, I think I was like 26, I was tired of this shit right, when I, right before I started studying law. Like, for real, for real. Like, you're like, about 26, I went and I was tired and I tried to get my driver's license. And they would not let me get my driver's license. They said that the, the the DMV told me I needed to go downtown and pay the courtroom. I went to the courthouse. The courthouse told me I could not pay the ticket because the judge of my first case, he's not working for the state of North Carolina anymore. You get what I'm saying? So they wouldn't even let me get it. So what's he saying about these contracts? Do you have a contract? When I let them know at the end of them trying to charge me with driving out a license and shit, can you present me a contract? They can't because I never signed. I've never had a, a driver's license. Now, I have an identification card. Now, when I was in Jersey, I told you I got arrested with my cousin and them, and we all walked out of there because we all said we was Moors. You know what I'm saying? And they knew I was from out of state. You know what I'm saying? And my cousins had child support warrants, and they still didn't arrest these niggas. You know what I'm saying? This shit is real, but you need to know what you have to understand that it's a you need to start digging in history and law and history go hand to hand because you need to know the history of the law you speaking and what does it relate to because the judge asks you these questions. But since I don't, since I never had a contract, I never had a driver's license. You know what I'm saying? When I go to court, it's hard for them to arrest me because I never gave a corporation the authority to do anything. Because think about it. I'll prove it. This is what I tell the judge for the record. There's a judicial executive, right? And the and what is it? Legislative is the police station. Is the is the police station? Is the is the Department of Motor Vehicles? Is any it, are is the police station or Department of Motor Vehicles in any of those branches of law? No. So it's unconstitutional. I don't care what kind of contract it is. If you don't have a driver's license and they pull you over, the first thing you need to say is, I, I don't have a contract. They may still give you the ticket, but understand that if there are other things, which I already explained in the language of silence, which because we are amongst non-mores tonight, I will not show you. However, there's a language of silence that you can speak to these people and they will not bother you. You can trust me on that. However, if you are not comfortable and you happen to get off your square and you get the ticket and you have to go to court, that's the first thing you have to say. I don't have a contract. And all of these courts, because they are corporations, the only type of policy they can deal with is contract policy, not contract law, contract policy. So the first thing you must ask is what? Do we have a contract? And if the answer is no, then I'm here under threat, duress, and coercion. You are violating my rights. It's as simple as that. You have no other reason to be there. Does that make sense? The reason why you want, you're there under stress, duress, and coercion is because you got a letter or they told you you had to come to court th that day. And when I let them know, for the record, I'm, I'm, I'm a moor, but I'm here because I came under threat, duress, and coercion. You said if I didn't come that you will arrest me or send me to jail. And you say it for the record. And they were like, no, no, well, we just wanted you to come in. Okay. If the state comes in and says, you're not treating your children right and we want to take them, right? The first thing you have to say is state. Do I have a contract that says I gave my children to you? That I, at what point produce the contract? Produce the contract. If you send me a bill and understand that if you belong to the corporate board state, you can't make these arguments because you do have a contract, which is the birth certificate, which is the marriage license, which a marriage license is your contract, is the woman's contract with the state and the man's contract with the state. It's not a contract between the man and the woman. Never was, never will be. Unless you have a prenuptial agreement or something else, you don't have a marriage contract. Another thing, though, a loophole in that legally is that uh, your parents signed your birth certificate. You didn't. So when you're in court and when they bring this information to you, for the record, 
They like they asked me one day. They was like, "Sir, where were you born?" You don't, and I was like, "I don't." I, when were what day were you born? I don't know. Because you don't. Because when you were born, you wasn't really conscious of it. You was in a certain state of mind as a as a baby that you weren't conscious. It's a legal answer. You know what I'm saying? So the loopholes, it's always loopholes that uh, it's a certain language that you speak in the courtrooms that are reality if you understand how, if you understand law. With the one you think you love, you have a contract with somebody else who, who becomes a third party to your life, always, till you rescind the contract, all right? Because that's not how you get married. Marriage is under all law. All right. And then what you're responsible to do is to place the oath that you take between the two of you on the public record. Where? Where do you place information on the public record? Do you know? With the county. The counties are ancient. They belong to us. They belong to us. Our ancestors named the counties. Our ancestors formed the counties. Our ancestors set up the, the government of the counties and the counties operate according to common law, which is royal law, which is Muslim cup. Law, which is Muslim customary law. Did y'all know that? The counties belong to us. Remember Ty, I said that the, the Constitution derived from Muslim law? So let me, let me write this for you. Putting that work in, right? How many of you think you live in Philadelphia County? For, for those who, okay. <laughs> okay. All right. When, here, here we go. See that? Do you, do you recognize that there's a difference between the two? There's a difference between Philadelphia County, which our ancestors set up with certain geographical boundaries, and that corporate, nonprofit corporation that calls itself the County of Philadelphia. It is a corporation chartered to conduct business and commerce and trade and all that within the geographical boundary of Philadelphia County. They are two different things. They are two different things. So when you see documents, pay attention because all documents that you get don't have County of Philadelphia on them. And you know the difference between the two because if you get documents from the County of Philadelphia, you know that you're receiving correspondence from a corporation. Do you understand? And if you're receiving correspondence from a corporation, the first question you must ask is, do we have a contract? Now, if you receive correspondence from the county, that's common law. You have the responsibility to respond and adhere to that because guess what? You are a part and parcel of that county. Our ancestors set up these, these uh, geographical boundaries for us, all right? Now, likewise, with any other county or city, pay attention to this one little word. It's a very dangerous word. I'm gonna tell you, and as I tell people in my class, when that word shows up, you automatic, you're in trouble. The reason is because most of you prior to tonight, you didn't understand that there was a difference in when they use that little word of. But trust me, there's a difference between whether you're dealing with government or corporation. Government or corporation. You have to know the difference. And if you don't know the difference. Like you be, like, like, like your, your kids go to school in Wake County. But when you get a ticket or something, it say the county of Wake. Between these things, they gonna have you swinging left and right in the dark and hitting nothing. Okay? I want to explain to you that when you're dealing in contracts, your status in the contract is very important. How do you establish your presence in a contract so that you are protected? Does anybody know how to do that? Because we're confronted with contracts all the time. And when we 
do not adhere to certain terms and conditions of the contract, which we did not understand from the very beginning, then we're dragged into court to answer for all kinds of claims and allegations on behalf of the corporation, and we don't even understand why we're there. We think for the most part, the majority of us, and prior to tonight, you get a summons to appear in court, I don't care whether that's a civil action or a criminal action. You are on the defensive because you feel that inherently, maybe I have done something that warrants these allegations. Even if you know for a fact that you're innocent, because the way that corporate system operates, you are not innocent until proven guilty. You are guilty until proven innocent. And the reason is because, as, as some of these uh, sovereign pe state sovereignty people would have you believe, um, the, the United States has declared war on the people. We're in a state of martial law. Well, of course you are. If the people have agreed to, to be corporate wards of a state that's a private nonprofit corporation, and the government operates according to sovereignty and you agree not to be sovereign, then what have you done? You've abandoned your government. The only thing the government can do is declare war on you. That's why you walk into a military tribunal when you walk into these courtrooms. That's why they have a military flag, which is a USA flag with the gold fringe, that lets you know you're in a military tribunal. And the reason is because you've agreed not to be sovereign. So the only way they can deal with you is in a military fashion. Y'all understand that? Okay. So how to protect yourself when you're dealing in, the first thing, I'm not going to really get into details of explaining to you how to stand on your square and how to be in court and all that. The first thing you must understand is how to exist in contracts. That, because if you understand how to exist in contracts, that will significantly reduce your ever having to go to court, to the courtroom. Okay, to the courtroom. If you understand how to deal in contracts, because all these corporations do is deal in contracts, and all the courts, courts, these court systems, let me say that, do is deal in contracts. So if you're not familiar with the contracts, and the majority of their contracts are these. Adhesion contracts. Look in the Law and Dictionary, look up the word adhesion, and what you're going to find is that an adhesion contract is a type of contract where there are terms and conditions that are a part of the contract of which you are not aware. And every time you sign a birth certificate, there's a the balance of that contract is somewhere. Whenever you sign a Ford driver's license, the balance of that contract is somewhere. You don't have it, you've never seen it, but it does exist. And this is why they have the authority to issue you a ticket for all these different things and violations because there's a contract somewhere that you've signed and you have not reserved your rights. So if you don't reserve your rights, your rights are considered waived upon signing of the contract, which means that you know, understand, and agree that there's an adhesion going on and you don't care or you otherwise are not aware. They don't care. They've got you to sign. How do you go back now and correct the fact that you signed all these adhesion contracts everywhere all your life you've signed them? I know you have, because I have too. And now's the time for you to get back into your proper person so you can correct those contracts and get out of the ones you don't want to have and the ones you choose to have, you can exist under your own terms and conditions. That's the most important part. That's long before you get to go into court. Because you can go to court all day long, but guess what? Unless you correct the problem, the root of the problem, which is not knowing how to exist in contracts, you'll constantly go to court, and that's a waste of your time. I'm sure you have many more productive things to do than to keep showing up in court, making special appearance and proper persona sujures and stating your status for the record, okay? Now, the first thing you need to do is contact, contact. Contact those entities with whom you have a contract and tell them that in no uncertain terms you want to correct or otherwise change or revise the terms and conditions of your contract. You have the right to do that and you must. All right? If you're going to have the contracts, exist in those contracts under your own terms and conditions. Just because somebody hands you an application and that application has pretty little boxes and everything on it. If there's categories up there that don't apply to you, don't fill it out. Add a box. 
that applies to you. And then when, when we take people to the Social Security Administration to get their name corrected on their Social Security card, this is what, this is what happens. There's a section on there for race, okay? Okay, that's just some of them. They may have a few more. I don't remember, okay? Do any of those boxes apply to you? Not even the one other. It does not apply to you. So what do you do? You are a more. Tell them who you are. If you don't, and you put any other category up there, you have signed it and you have made a contract with them and they're going to hold you to that contract. And then if you go back and try to change the contract, they'll say, well, they won't tell you in these words. They'll say, well, we can't do that. Well, why can't they do it? It's because you didn't reserve your rights, but guess what? They reserved all of theirs. And they have the right to not change the contract just because you want to. They I was in the DMV like two years ago and you know the IDs now, I don't think that they say, they don't say black or white no more up there. But back in the day they did, and I said something to him. It was a little further back than three years ago, and I asked him, and he was like, yo, you white or black? And I was like, yo, don't put that up there. And I was explaining to the person it was a black guy, an older black guy, why not to put it up there? He was like, yo, I never knew that. And he was like, yo, I won't put nothing up there. You know what I'm saying? Because he couldn't, he said, he, I said, you can't put more, so they didn't. And when I got stuck, he started asking, me, why don't you have this on your, because I'm not black. They reserve that right. Now, what you and the only way you can get out of it is step out. <laughs> Here we go. What I'm saying is that I want y'all to understand. Oh, I got a little bit in box. I want y'all to understand that you're going to get upset because when you go on to say a lot of this shit, you're going to be looking at people that look just like you. And they work for the courthouse or the court system. And a lot of these people don't even, they don't know. They just go to work. They get up and go to work and they get paid to do this shit. They send it to the DMV. They have never heard of it before. Not a lot of people disrespect you over it, but it's not like they teaching on it, but it's laws. You have to make them go get somebody who can go pull up something half the time. You know what I mean? If they give you a hard time. But it is true. You know what I mean? See that? Do you, do you recognize that there's a difference between the two? There's a difference between Philadelphia County, which our ancestors set up with certain geographical boundaries, and that corporate, nonprofit corporation that calls itself the County of Philadelphia. It is a corporation chartered to conduct business and commerce and trade and all that within the geographical boundary of Philadelphia exactly, County. Like there are USA two different things. They are two different things. So when you see documents, pay attention because all documents that you get don't have County of Philadelphia on them. And you know the difference between the two because if you get documents from the county of Philadelphia, you know that you're receiving correspondence from a corporation. Do you understand? And if you're receiving correspondence from a corporation, the first question you must ask is, do we have a contract? Now, if you receive correspondence... Now, I want to show y'all something else. Now, y'all want to see the rest of this? You go to... Because I want to show y'all something because I want to be clear about what I'm showing y'all. Right? Because we're going, we going, I'm going to be clear from the jump. And stay on if y'all up here because it's very important. When we deal with the Moors, the next thing that you hear about the Moors is how you can move and you can go into a house and you can take it, right? So I'm going to show y'all this and then I'm going to break down why you can't do that shit and why it's, that they're misleading. You may not have heard scammers. of the Moorish Nationals, but police have members claim to follow Moorish science. It comes from a black religious group that's been around for nearly a century. Most of its members obey the law, but not everyone. Chip Reed looks at how some use their religion to justify the crime. You see how they always use her to talk the shit about black people? 
This 35,000 square foot mansion in an exclusive corner of Bethesda, Maryland has 12 bedrooms, 17 bathrooms, and trees planted by President Clinton and Vice President Gore. On the market for nearly $6 million, it's not exactly a steal. So imagine real estate agent Jordan Feinberg's surprise when he learned someone had moved into the vacant property. The owner calls me again and says, the neighbor called their people inside the house claiming they own the house. And I'm like, what? Lamont Butler, a.k.a. Lamont Maurice L., claimed the mansion for himself. He even provided documents issued by the so-called Moorish National Republic to back it up. It's a burglary in the you know, purest sense. Across the country, Butler and many other self-styled Moorish nationals have laid claim to property and status they say is lawfully theirs because their ancestors were here first. In Memphis, Tennessee, Tabitha Gentry staked a claim on this $3 million foreclosed home using heavy chains charged with trespassing, burglary, and theft. Gentry, who prefers the name Abka Ray Bay, says as a citizen of the Moorish American National and this man was arrested by police in Fayetteville, North Carolina, for interfering with a stolen car investigation. But his wife claims the arrest was illegal because he is a member of the Moorish nation. Moors trace their beliefs to noble Drew Ali, who founded the Moorish Science Temple in Chicago in 1925. With tens of thousands of followers, the faith borrows heavily from Islam. It also teaches that all black Americans are Moorish Americans, descendants of an ancient Moroccan global empire, an idea some followers have taken one step further. So you don't have to get a, a license plate or a driver's license. You can lay claim to property. Spencer Dew, who studies the movement, says Moorish Americans have long taken pride in being American citizens. But as the group splintered over the decades, some offshoots abandoned that view. But I also think we have some opportunistic individuals, um, some sort of lone wolf elements. Jeff Fort is perhaps the most notorious movement member. The former leader of a violent Chicago street gang, he was convicted in 1987 of conspiring with Libya's Gaddafi regime to blow up U.S. government buildings. It's kind of a public relations nightmare. The vast majority of Moorish communities uh, in America are not involved in any of this sovereign citizen uh, ideology, not involved in fraudulent behavior, not involved in criminal acts. As for Butler, he eventually abandoned the Bethesda mansion, but he still faces charges of burglary, theft, and fraud. He's currently out on bond. You know, everybody likes to look at a big, beautiful house, but, um, Usually you call a realtor to unlock the door for you. For CBS This Morning, Chip Reed, Washington. You may not have heard. Now let me tell you why I showed y'all that. Because I give, I'm going to give y'all the, the whole thing. Okay. When it comes down to certain people talking about their moors and you can go. First of all, we lost the war. So let's be clear. If we lost the war, we can't just go take a house, nigga. We ain't got a military to go take all these fucking mansions back to take them. So that's just keep it in the band if you want to understand that from a true perspective. Now, the dude, he never said that it wasn't true with the Moors said. Pay attention. He just said, no, most of the time they're not and no, they're not. But these are just opportunistic. People take the law and bend them. Now, in the aspect of why when I say I change my name, why they can't challenge me? Because by law, as long as it's not done in fraudulent intent, you can't get in trouble. And if you go take a house in that manner, there's a fraudulent intent involved. And that's why by law, them people are getting arrested and going to jail. At the same time, it's also certain people from the temples who told these people these things and then they all got arrested. Everybody in the temple got arrested, but the head person got sent back out. So it made it, it made everybody who was studying feel like these were like federal agents. So just understand what's going on. You know what I'm saying? So I want you to understand when you're dealing with these situations that not one time did they say that the Moors wasn't who they said they were. You know what I'm saying? Not one time did they even challenge. They just called it a religious group. You know what I'm saying? So at the end of the day, just always remember certain things while I brought it to you. Do not do the fraudulent. I don't give a fuck what you think you are. Like, understand. It's certain things that if you do it in fraud, you can't take a house back if you ain't got the military. You know what I'm saying? You can't do certain things. You have to understand that 
if it's not done, my name, I, my name is I Bay. Did you go to court? No, but, but what gives you the right? Because it's not done in fraudulent intent. And did you say, where did you do it? I said it now in the courtroom. You don't realize when you're in a courtroom and you make a statement that is law. It's like because you're in the courts. And for the record, you know what I'm saying? Just like how, just like the serial killer Ted Bundy got married in the courtroom because he said it in the courtroom. And that by law, it's like, yeah, well, I guess he's married if they agree to it. Do you know what I'm saying? So I'm just telling y'all that because that's why, why you think they started showing like the last four or five years, they started showing so much news about the Moorish Americans. And some people started thinking that it was a, 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 a how should I say, a covert move for them penetrating certain temples, having members join the temple and go commit crimes. You know what I'm saying? So it's the same thing with the Black Panther movement, movement and everything, but y'all should know that then, before all of this, King, Malcolm, all of them, Marcus Garvey was before all of them, and they all took from Garvey. Garvey mentioned that he knew who Noble Jew Ali was, and Noble Jew was trying to get him to understand nationality. But Garvey thought that we, that his people shouldn't be focused on that. We should be trying to get back to Africa. And Elijah sat at the table with Garvey in that same circle. So I'm just telling y'all, this is some real history. So get the history is what I'm saying. I'm not telling you to go and do nothing, but educate yourself and start studying law uh, and get your history. Get that piece because part of your missing pride is in there. Once I got that missing piece, I always had a message with my music. But once I really started understanding who I was and had an understanding that where I come from, then of course I would think that I could do anything I want. You know what I'm saying? So it's like, shit, you think you're a rapper. Shit, you think you're a goddamn movie uh, actor, everything. Like, yo, we all that. You know what I'm saying? All of us. Not just me. You know what I'm saying? I ain't nothing special. I'm just an example of somebody going out there to get it. You know what I'm saying? So I appreciate y'all for tapping in. I missed y'all this morning. You know what I'm saying? Check out the music. Willie Walker BH is how you find it. Uh, my, my YouTube is Black House, B-L-A-C-C-H-O-U-Z-E. And that's what my videos and my album I just dropped is um is the art of being organic. You know what I'm saying? Let me see some. Check it out. You know what I'm saying? My music deal with a lot of my it's still my same mindset. You know what I'm saying? It's, so rock with me. I appreciate y'all for checking in, and I'm gonna get up in the morning and we're gonna tap back in. And look, I know some of my concepts, right? Because I ain't feel right. Because I felt like if I don't go live, I feel like people would be waiting for me to go live. Not for me, but for the information. You know what I'm saying? Or just for that mind, that mindset. So if I miss y'all in the morning, just inbox me and know that I'm, I'm going to come with something at night. But I just be wanting to make sure that I give y'all the right shit. You know what I'm saying? And being, um, being mature with the information. I ain't really worried about getting in trouble like that. Because listen, I mean... I done represented myself in court like seven times. My homeboy said I'm on the red list, but I was all of this already. But like I told my mother, like I'm free. You know what I'm saying? You know, death is promised to everybody. I ain't getting no threats or nothing, but I ain't, it's just who I am. Like at the end of the day, as a black man, my life on the line every day. You know what I'm saying? But as a, as a musician, our true role to good artists is that we're not musicians. We are community leaders. And we and our job is to educate. He said, I'm going to need to have extra convo after this if you have a minute about how this applies to family law. Oh, no doubt. Listen, let me say this too, okay, because you this is a good conversation. So I can talk a lot. I come from a family of women. So family law. So you know how you can have family and they're called people that, like, it could be the father side of family, your family, or people could just call social services, diapers, whatever it's called, where you're from. Child protective services on you. And let's say they come in and they investigating you, right? So what I did when I had first got with um, my lady, what I did was they, uh, the family called. I'm sitting there. I'm thinking like, what? So I'm listening to them saying this shit. So I always let them say what they're going to say. And then at the end of the day, I always check them. Now, your job is to know the history of where they come from. You, are, you guys are a corporation. Now, according to the Constitution, that the courts cannot come between a family, Right? Now, and this is why I tell you to have custody, like my mother used to always say, and we talked about this the other day, me and my mother, and she was saying that when she, when you have your children, don't feel bad if you don't, you didn't know. If you do, if you never, if you have your children, by law, I mean, by nature, they're yours, but by the system we in today, the state owns your baby, you know what I'm saying? So you got to go file for custody, whether if you mommy or daddy, don't matter. Once you get custody, then you can, you can get a lot more leeway with your kids, this is learn how to fight in the system. So then when they come in your so then when they come in um when they come in your house, well, 
whether if you got it or not, you still can exercise your law if you know it. But that's just if you if you want to find other ways to fight it. Understand that in family law that the courts are not allowed to come in between. So I always you just need to know like the history of, of the company and tell it to them like respectfully. And you don't have the right to come in here. You know what I'm saying? What gives you the right? Like I like for example, they're coming in. Well, we just gonna look through your refrigerator and da da da. I remember that shit years ago. And I told them, like, yo, what right do you have to look through anybody's refrigerator? You have no right. You know what I'm saying? You are a corporation. I am not Negro, black, or color, and none of the kids on here. We're all Moors. That's why you want to have a flag in your house. And I was handing them the treaty of friendship and peace. Dead ass. And the white women got the fuck up out of that house quick as shit. I, I, like how Pac say? How Pac say that shit? Um, I swear I was. <laughs> they get the fuck up out of that house. I'm telling you, ask people when they get up out of that house. When they come up in the house and they see that flag hanging up or something like that, hand it to them. You know what I'm saying? He said, if you involve them out of ignorance, how do you get them back out? Okay, I get what you're saying. We're going to chop it up. You know what I'm saying? It says, I'm working on the flag now. Word. But now that's the power of it, man. I know y'all seen them joints and them, them, them. It's just do your research on it. Like, I wasn't even looking for the shit. I'm studying. History in Egypt and the more pop up. And everywhere I go in history, the more pop up. And it's just like, God damn, why did it just keep popping up? And I always remember in the book, Destruction of the Black Civilization, he said to my people in America, somebody has to investigate our connection to the estate in the history of the Moors. I'm out. <laughs>